Welcome everyone to the, what day is it? June 7th uh, City Council Strategy Session. Um, we welcome back all of our friends from the media who are in the room this evening. And I will uh, mention that Mayor Lyles will be joining us soon. She uh, is wrapping up another um, call that she had to finish. So she'll be with us. But before we go ahead and do that, we're going to go ahead and take introductions. And why don't we start um, with everybody in the room, and then we'll go to our council members that are online. Um, and so why don't we start with Ms. Tree Hagler. Good evening, Tari Hagler Gray, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Patrick Baker, City Attorney. Charles Bacari, District 6. Larkin Eggleston, District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Ed Driggs, District 7. Marcus Jones, City Manager. Julie Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem and Serving at Large. Greg Phipps at Large. Renee Johnson, District 4. Victoria Watlington, District 3. Matt Newton, District 5. Stephanie Kelly, City Clerk. Billy Tons, Interim Deputy City Clerk. Uh, Denara Jackson, Office of Constituent Services. Emily Kunze, City Manager's Office. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, and with that, could we have introductions from our colleagues online? Monday, Dimple Ajmira at large. Braxton Winston at large. Thank you all. Um, before we get started, I want to just uh, recognize that this in the past week or so, we've uh, lost two members of the media with, who were formerly with the Charlotte Observer, and they were very beloved in the community. And we just want to recognize first photographer David Foster, who was a gifted storyteller and an incredible story, uh, gifted and talented storyteller. He covered every major city event dating back to the 1990s. And everyone always enjoyed getting to see him when he was out in the community. And he had a lot of friends that, um, that are going to be missing him, friends and colleagues. In addition, uh, we also lost sports writer Rick Bonnell, who was one of the best journalists, sports journalists in the entire country and was highly respected and revered uh, uh, in the game of basketball, in the NBA in particular. He provided the community with excellent coverage, coverage of our basketball teams and did a tremendous job telling the stories of the players, staff, and the fans who were a part of the Hornets and the Bobcats. So um, we just wanted to acknowledge their passing and our condolences to their friends, families, and colleagues. With that, we're going to go ahead. We only have two items on the agenda this evening. And we're going to flip the order so that Mayor Lyles can um, be here to attend the uh, conversation on the comprehensive, the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan, the final recommendation for the plan. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and go to our committee uh, report outs. And we will go ahead and start, and I hope I didn't take everybody by surprise on that, but we're going to go ahead and start with um, the Budget and Effectiveness Committee. And I'll turn it over to our uh, committee chair, Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, the Budget and Effectiveness Committee met on June 3rd. Um, the members are uh, myself as chair, Mayor Pro Tem, ISIL as vice chair, council members Ajmira, Graham, and Johnson. And on our agenda at that meeting was a discussion of our virtual meeting options. And this pertained both to the option for council members to participate in council meetings uh, as well as members of the public virtually. And uh, essentially, we were reminded of the environment in which we're in legally where uh, we have been operating under a special law, a state law that allowed us to conduct our virtual meetings the way we have been without any question or controversy. When the state of emergency ends, that law will be lifted and we will essentially revert to the rules that the council has, the procedures that we have, and the state laws that are in effect. State law on this subject is actually quite limited. Um, so a lot of the decision making about this uh, does come down to us. And one of the things that we recognized in the meeting was that at the moment we still have outstanding an action that we took that said that virtual participation in meetings was possible for council members without limit, uh, without time limit or any other restrictions indefinitely. And that was fine during the emergency period and while the special law was in effect. 
but we need to be a little more thoughtful about it when it comes to the period after the state of emergency is lifted. So uh, the action that we took in the meeting that was approved four to one was to recommend to full council that we sunset that action that we took regarding the unlimited participation, virtual participation in meetings. Um, and that was a four to one vote. And then um, we also voted three to two that we should consider broadening rule 28, which is where the conditions for virtual participation in meetings are listed. So uh, we will probably at our next meeting bring to council, I think for a vote at that time, those two recommendations from the committee and, and also a third recommendation which passed three to two, which was that members of the public should be allowed to participate virtually in our meetings, regardless of whether we are. So those are the three things. Sunset, the, the action that we took before, which made virtual participation unlimited, uh, consider broadening the conditions under which virtual participation is possible, and, uh, and then consider that the public may be allowed to participate virtually in our meetings, uh, regardless of what we decide about our own participation. Uh, I will just say personally on this subject that um, the resolution on this issue is not going to be just legal. In fact, the legal situation is unclear, perhaps, but in my mind, not the most important thing. So what we all need to be thinking about is the significance of being here in person for our meetings, being available to face members of the public who come to the chamber to see us. And I think those will be the issues that we're all gonna to wanna to talk about when uh, this does come up for a vote. I can tell you that my personal opinion is that I think that we should be in person at uh, council meetings and committee meetings. And, uh, but again, the council will have the opportunity to consider that uh, when we vote uh, next week, it'll be on the agenda. I wanted to briefly report also, Mayor Pertem, on a special committee that the mayor appointed to consider the, the office of the city clerk and its operations. And essentially this was a group that consisted of myself, Council Member Ajmira and Council Member Phipps. And we were briefed there as well on some of the legal constraints and operational issues related to the clerk's office, the responsibilities of the clerk, but in essence, as far as a decision by council is concerned, uh, the gist of it was we are required by our own statutes, by our own ordinances to uh, appoint, the council is required to appoint the clerk in Charlotte. And because you don't really want to have a separation of who appoints the clerk and who reviews the clerk, the, count, the clerk's reviews should also be conducted by council. Um, the thing that the committee is recommending is that uh, the council will continue to conduct the, perform the performance evaluation of the city clerk, uh, but that the city manager will provide us with a memo uh, to guide us in that process so that we will get sort of briefed by the city manager who will have better oversight of the operation of the clerk's office and some of those issues that we just are unable to observe ourselves. And that has been the issue. We've been called upon to review the city clerk and I think most of us felt that we really just didn't know enough about the operation of that office. Uh, we also recommended that the city continue to explore enhancements to public records management systems which will benefit all departments. So part of this discussion was with IT people and so on, whether we have all the best technologies and we will continue to work with the city clerk to consider whether any improvements in that area are indicated. Uh, Mr. Manager, I don't know if we need to vote on this or uh, I think without uh, objection, uh, we would sort of proceed along those lines. So uh, do I hear any objections? I'm not seeing any. Again, the idea is that we will review the clerk, but that we will get guidance from the manager prior to that performance review. That's my report. Great. Thank you, Mr. Drake. Any questions, Mr. Johnson? Thank you. I want to <clears throat> I wanted to clarify the report. During the committee meeting, um, we were going to look at Rule 28 as well as the council policies in general, right? Correct. I mean, okay. the action we took said that we would broaden the terms of Rule 28 that, as they related to virtual participation in meetings. Right now, we have an existing policy that says that virtual participation is possible in, in, in case of emergency or illness or some other circumstance like that. And Councilmember Johnson, you had suggested, and uh, the majority of the committee agreed with you that we should look at whether or not an expansion of those things is appropriate. And we will, by the way, also pursue the other part of your motion, 
which is to consider some of our procedures. But I think that will be a separate initiative on the committee. Thank you. Mr. Phipps? <clears throat> uh, with regard to um, citizen participation in meetings, what would be different um, if we couldn't do it virtually and the public has an opportunity to do it virtually? Uh, would that be the same as live streaming on Facebook? Or what would be different than what uh, the public can do now? Uh, I think the public has the opportunity to observe our meetings now on Facebook and on YouTube uh, and the government channel. So really the question is whether people that want to speak to us would need to be here in person to do that or whether we would have some sort of a WebEx environment that allowed them to appear in front of us virtually. And I don't think we need to finalize the conversation on that subject, but the, the motion was made in committee and approved three to two that we bring forward to the full council the, the suggestion that members of the public could participate virtually. And that's the thing that we will all talk about and decide uh, as an agenda item at our next meeting. Any other questions? We're good. All right, thank you. With that, we'll move on to the Great Neighborhoods Committee, and we'll have an update, uh, and I'll turn it over to our chair, Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, the Great Neighborhoods Committee is, again, consists of uh, Braxton Winston is our vice chairman, uh, Tarek Bakari, uh, Julia Iso, the mayor pro tem, and Victoria uh, Wallington uh, as our committee members. Uh, basically, uh, the update is the Great Neighborhoods Committee did not meet in May. However, the source of income ad hoc advisory committee held their initial kickoff meeting on May 20th. Uh, as a reminder, the source of income advisory committee is charged with developing recommendations, program enhancements, and process improvements that will increase the acceptance of all forms of rental subsidies, including the Housing Choice Voucher Program, the largest source of rental assistance in our community. Uh, at the May meeting, the ad hoc committee identified five key areas for their work in the coming months as governed by the committee charge. Uh, their focal areas are five, as I indicated. One, data, the need for data to inform action items, recommendation, and metrics. Two, research to establish best practice to inform recommendations and metric setting to increase acceptance of vouchers and other rental assistance programs and process to encourage private sector landlords to reconsider accepting vouchers and to gain new landlord acceptance. Third is landlord education to increase property owners' knowledge and awareness of housing choice vouchers and other rental um, assistance programs to increase landlord participation. Fourth, communication strategies to help remove the stigma of voucher households. Uh, then lastly, five, um, to create benchmark criteria to evaluate outcomes of committee recommendations. Uh, the, the Ad Hoc Committee will meet up in the coming months through December 21st, uh, which they will evaluate the outcome of their work and develop recommendations for the City Council's consideration. The Ad Hoc Committee will meet monthly on the third Thursday of each month at 10 a.m. Uh, the meetings can be viewed by the public via WebEx, and staff is also exploring the ability to live stream these meetings as well. Uh, additionally, periodical updates will be provided to council. Uh, the next meeting of the SOI committee is Thursday, um, June 17th at 10 a.m. Uh, and finally, the, the next meeting of the Great Neighborhoods Committee is June 16th at 12 p.m. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, uh, Mr. Graham. Any questions on that? Okay, thanks. Uh, the next committee report out is the Intergovernmental Relations Committee, and we will have either uh, our, one of our co-chairs, Mr. Picard or Mr. Winston, would like to report. Ms. Uh, I'll go ahead and hit a couple high-level items, and Mr. Winston, you can add on to anything I miss. Um, so I think the, the two probably most relevant things that everyone here would care about um, are one, the elections legislation and what's going on in Raleigh, and two, the, um, uh, the budget. Obviously, both of those impact Charlotte greatly. So first, on the elections bill, you've gotten an update from Dana recently. Um, things have rolled out of the Senate just about. The House is taking things up now. The Senate version pretty simply runs it as all municipalities in North Carolina, Charlotte being one of those 43 that fall into this bucket, that have districts and are impacted by the census delay, um, will be pushed to 
2022. That's this next cycle, but in observation of several things, including um, including the fact that by design, these weren't meant to be even year elections. They've got their own unique cycle. So you'll see a filing period that starts either in December or January, depending on which milestones we meet. Um, a primary that's in March and a general that's in April, which was the old second um, primary runoff. So clearly that, that is um, um, unprecedented stuff there, but we're in unprecedented times. I would just say that my expectation is we will see more edits and tweaks to this as we, um, as we see it progress through the House in the next, uh, in the next week or so. Uh, and then the, the, as it relates to the budget, I know the last update you all saw was um, the, the House and the Senate um, have had some challenges seeing eye to eye and coming up with their unified proposal. Um, I think the reasoning for that is, you know, we've seen this stuff in the past, but for now it's just more complicated and the dollar amounts are much larger. I do believe, though, from what I'm hearing, that as soon as tomorrow we may hear some announcement that the, um, that the Senate and the House have found agreement which is a very big deal. And then it just comes uh, to the question of the next steps, which are complicated at that, but then the, um, the decision between what the General Assembly and then ultimately what the governor will sign. And obviously, as we know, we're tracking, there's a laundry list of budget items and things like that that have direct impact, impact and implications to us. So, uh, Mr. Winston, would you add anything to that? I think you hit the uh, uh, meat of it. Um, there were just some other updates that we had about ongoing um, work that has not been completed in both uh, Raleigh and Washington, D.C., around efforts to decrease the digital divide, uh, deliberations around infrastructure packages, um, uh, mass mandates at, at airport, um, police recordings, and other items. So there is a lot um, going on in Raleigh um, and, and D.C. that we are keeping an eye on. Um, but uh, as I said, Mr. Bakari hit the really hit the stuff that is in the, either in the final kind of uh, legs or has been completed in the past week or so. Can I ask a question? Yes, Mr. Driggs. Uh, I should probably know this, but do any of those dates you just talked about coincide with dates for the 2022 election schedule? Well, they do, in fact, uh, Mr. Driggs. And um, one of the, he, here are the two wild cards that I think we as Charlotte, Charlotte citizens and elected officials should watch for. One is, who gets, if everything stays in this bill the same, who gets the, a, a potential primary runoff from the Senate race? Because we are in the second primary runoff date, which means we have no primary runoff. There is no percentage threshold. So if somebody has a runoff, which we, don't, we rarely have, whoever got the most goes forward, and our general election is on that date that normally is unutilized. However, if the Republicans or the Democrats or both in the primary race uh, for Senate have a runoff or, any, yeah, or anything, but the, that's the one that's most substantial, they would also share that same ticket with us. Now, I would say that the odds of that happening are a lot less likely now that they've ratcheted it down from 40 to 30 percent in the last few years. So that's wild card number one, because clearly us being in a random time in an even year is very difficult for us who normally are the top of the ticket in these odd years. Um, but then two, one of the things they are considering in the House right now, um, given that this is a constitutional issue that we have to push the, um, the, the, um, the district levels that uh, are subject to the redraws for the census out, they have to do that, have to. There is no requirement to do that for at large and mayor. So they are contemplating right now in the House, if they add in giving us the authority to separate out district races that would happen next year at that time from at-large and mayoral races that would happen now, which there'd be no constitutional reason not to do that. The only reason we wouldn't would be because, um, would be because we decided essentially to delay them. So I think um, that'll be very interesting to watch over the next week. I, I think to, um, I know Mr. Drake, you didn't necessarily um, ask about this, but um, I, I think an important thing for us to look at with the calendar is our own um, schedule. Um, and this might be something you want to consider in budget and effectiveness, that it is, in fact, a general election does, in fact, sit right in the middle of the, 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 our typical budget cycle. 
um, in the middle of April. Um, so that can potentially, just kind of from kind of looking at things from a 10,000 foot view, um, that might dictate um, how we go about doing our business um, over the next, what is it, eight months? Um, and how do we set up, um, you know, that January, um, that, that January uh, uh, retreat, uh, a budget retreat? Uh, does that still happen in January? Does it need to happen ahead of time? Um, and how do we kind of think about, you know, just our, our normal um, um, calendar? Because it's completely um, um, kind of blown up at, at this point in time with the way the schedule works. We could be swearing in new people weeks before the adoption of the budget. Uh, of course, the budget is co capably handled by our manager and <laughs> staff that, you know, I, I think we're all going to be fine with it. But uh, that is an issue. And uh, Councilmember Bakari, before you count out runoffs, remember old Calamity Phipps over there with his uh, two very close elections? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, got a, I got a question. Mr. Phipps. So what does this do to our uh, potential bond referendums that we were considering? Um, do we have to start planning for those or what do in we the, do? In the, well, I'll just tell you from the legislation that exists and then there's strategy that only the manager and others can talk to. Um, if we have no election on the books in Mecklenburg and that's where it stays, that we would have to call and ask for a special one this year which, I mean, that just seems highly unlikely. I think the, the real more likely question is, um, is this something, and it'll be better to discuss this once we know what makes it out of the House, is this something that now folks and the powers that be want to line up for the April um, general or the 2022 general general? And I, I don't know that anyone's contemplated that question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That's all clear as mud. Thank you for the. <laughs> well, I guess the punchline is um, if you are uh, at large or mayor, start fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Bakari and Mr. Winston. Uh, the next committee update is safe communities, and I will turn that over to our chair, Mr. Eggleston. I'll be briefer than my, uh, my colleague. Uh, we met last week and got updates on two big things, one of which has been well covered by our friends at the news media uh, around street racing and aggressive driving. We know that's been a problem and uh, all the more so since COVID uh, with streets being more wide open for folks to, to take advantage of the opportunity to speed. And actually the observer is in the midst of doing a multi-part piece right now. Um, it looks into a lot of the data around how unsafe our streets have gotten and how many people have lost their lives. Um, but good news for, on the CMPD front was after several months of undercover work and building cases against folks. Um, there were uh, a seizure of 65 cars, uh, numerous arrests. There are still some outstanding uh, authorizations to seize cars if and when they are, are found. Um, and we were offered some anecdotal evidence from CMPD at that meeting that uh, many of the folks who are leaders in this sort of underground car culture have said, well, we can't really play our games in Charlotte anymore because Charlotte's not, um, Charlotte's closed for business as it relates to street racing was a social media post that they, they shared with us from one of the folks who organizes a lot of these meetups. So that was really good news. Hopefully it sends a signal to people who are, are breaking the law and endangering both themselves and others on our streets. Um, but obviously still something we're going to have to continue to focus on, but that was a huge win. So. Again, great work for to CMPD. And then we got an update on the Family Justice Center. Um, the official ask of the city has changed from $10 million to $5 million. Um, committee members asked some questions that we're going to get a follow-up on at our next committee meeting. Um, but I think that the, the takeaway is we, we see the value in this, in this potential partnership. Um, there's just more information that's needed and, and more boxes that need to be checked before the city can be um, can sign on as a partner and help get, get this thing across the finish line. But uh, the values there, the commitment from the city to, um, to find a way to help with these efforts is there, and we're going to get some more information back based on committee member questions at our next meeting, which is actually um, not until September 7th. So uh, we can obviously schedule one in August if need be, but right now um, we don't see that need, and so it will be in September. 
Thank you. End Any questions for Mr. Eggleston for Safe Communities? <clears throat> I, I got a question. Mr. Phipps? I was wondering, in view of the, the frontline article that the observer is doing on excessive speeding on the streets of Charlotte, Mecklenburg, would, you know, <clears throat> as a committee, do we see any benefit that, uh, uh, of, of, of bringing this up in a meeting to see what, what kind of action we can take? Because it looks like law enforcement, I mean, is in dire straits in terms of uh, resources to enforce speeding. I don't know if we want to look at technology to see what we can do to curb some of uh, the excessive speeding we got that's apart from just yeah. ra street racing. So I was wondering <clears throat> what would be the appetite of the committee in wanting to do something like that. I think very open to it. And in fact, as I've been reading uh, the observer's coverage and seeing a lot of the other stuff that's going on, uh, I had the same thought, which is that we do need to figure out what, obviously we know laws in Raleigh have um, tied our hands to some degree in terms of things like red light cameras, um, and being able to even collect enough revenue to pay for this, a system like that. Um, but I do think there's opportunities for us to use technology because we know that we're not going to double our police force. The Highway Patrol is not going to suddenly get a, a huge flood of new funding to be able to put more people out on 485. Um, and that's really where they're needed. So in that article yesterday or today, it actually said we need twice as many Highway Patrol people in Mecklenburg County as we have. Uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So in, in lieu of actually having the man and woman power out there being able to pull folks over, uh, we've got to look for other alternatives. And so I do think that's something that we can bring up in the committee and figure out what options exist, what the costs are, and if we need to work with the intergovernmental committee to try to lobby for a change in that legislation that sort of um, put us in a bind with our ability to use things like the red light cameras. I would also just add to that that we started that conversation a couple of years ago. I'm a big supporter of looking at technology to assist our officers. We're down 180 officers as it is, and this is, you know, we want our officers to be doing um, the most important work. This is important, but if you have technology that can assist, then I think it's something we can look, we should look at. And so adding to the intergovernmental uh, work would also be talking to the school board because I think the law still stands that the money would have to go to the schools, but if there was a way to get an agreement with CMS to say excess funds after we pay for the data and the equipment so that we're not collecting money on this at a, you know, a net gain, but we offset our costs, the rest goes to the school board, I think would be really the path. And there are other cities in North Carolina that have had it. I don't know if they still do, but I just want to say kudos to the observer for that article. It was really in depth. They covered um, the history of the problem, the legislation, and I thought they did a really good job at put, shining a light on a, a really difficult problem that we have and CMPD needs help with. Ms. Watlington? Yep, I also support it. Um, I know we've been talking about it for a while. You said a couple of years. I know we've been discussing it at least since last summer, as long as we've been here. Um, so just for the purposes of getting it over there, I don't know if, Madam Mayor, you want to make that referral, or I'm happy to just move that we refer that to committee. Yes. Okay, I think that's Easy it. Easy peasy. That is it for uh, safe communities. The next committee is Transportation Planning and Environment Committee, which I chair. And my colleagues on the committee are Mr. Eggleston, Vice Chair, Mr. Driggs, Mr. Newton, and Mr. Winston. We had a really, um, a very eventful, well, action-packed meeting, I guess, in our last meeting. We had quite a few updates on just all of the different um, um, areas that work is being done in the area of transportation planning in particular. The first presentation was from John Lewis, our executive director of CATS, and he gave us an update on the station area planning for the Silver Line. Um, that has been going on for, well, the past 18 months they have been working on the preliminary planning and design to develop the alignment for the Silver Line project. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that they highlighted was that they took away some important lessons from the Blue Line um, project that the importance of leveraging the investments in our transportation infrastructure to meet other goals that we have, such as housing and economic development. Um, the study is, the, the 
The current study is to develop the station area plans for seven demonstration station areas, um, outline the infrastructure for all of those areas, and develop a TOD implementation plan. And that will, the scope of that, that study includes the outreach and education to key stakeholders, development of uh, housing strategies, key station areas, you know, what we want to see at those stations, um, and what the specific deliverables will be. So I like these other topic areas. I really encourage everybody to read this because um, I think a few of us didn't really realize that the station area planning was going on. So that begs the question is if, if those stations are set in stone. And so, you know, as we go through this work, everybody please take a look at it and bring your questions back to either Mr. Lewis or to the, to the committee um, for the next update on that. The second presentation was on Beyond 77, and that's a corridor study that, um, that goes up 77, I, obviously, I-77. The study area is 68 miles from Statesville to Rock Hill and six miles on either side of it. And the, the question is, how do we strengthen the multimodal network that surrounds the entire interstate? So the first phase of this study was a data collection phase, and it started in January of 2020. Uh, they did a lot of stakeholder engagement, um, public outreach, and they, they had um, responses from over 8,000 people. And it shouldn't be a huge surprise, but the number one concern was traffic congestion. Um, January 2021 began the process with the solution phase and looking at the data to come up with a number of different solutions. And so again, there was quite a bit of public engagement around possible solutions and ideas for the corridors around I-77 in, in addition to 77. And they received over 30 million clicks on the website providing feedback. So that's, that's an incredible amount of engagement. Um, they came up with 170 potential solutions and various feedback. And again, you know, please go to the uh, Beyond 77 website and just read more about that and what some of those solutions are. And then the pathway for that final recommendation will wrap up in the fall of this year, September 2021. Uh, and the team will finalize recommendations for phase three. Um, we'll begin that process in June prior to the final recommendation in September. And then Connect Beyond is a little confusing. It's different than Beyond 77. The Connect Beyond um, conversation started when CATS began to really re-envision the whole 20, their 2030 plan and how they're going to deliver high capacity uh, rail corridors to the entire community. They work with the Central Line Regional Council and they are um, looking beyond the typical planning boundaries to create a more connected network, transportation network. Um, the Connect Beyond region actually consists of the two states, and so South Carolina, North Carolina, and 12 counties, and it involves multiple transportation and planning organizations, 17 different transit agencies that have all come together in a partnership, and it's led by the Central Carolina Regional Council. CATS and the MTC to think about planning for a vibrant, connected, um, and inclusive vision for that entire region, which is a large region. So we're really trying, we're at this point getting um, the stakeholders together. I'm going to be re representing the council as the chair of transportation planning on that, on that, and I have been on the Connect Beyond um, initiative, but that will start to get into a little bit deeper work. Um, and again, the, the most important part purpose of the plan is to create a vision for regional transit, so across county lines and across state lines that can be supported by other counties in addition to Mecklenburg County, but also then that can go as a unified voice to talk about revenue sources to both of our states. So that was an update for uh, all of that. And... Um, the referrals that we still have in the TAP committee are the 2040 comp plan, the unified development plan, uh, short-term rentals, what are the options if the city is to regulate short-term re rentals, our mobility committee recommendations, and um, rezoning process improvements. How can we improve, uh, separate from the comp plan and the UDO, how do we improve the rezoning process for citizens and residents? 
So that is that we, we plan, we were supposed to have a meeting on June 21st is the next scheduled meeting. That is the day of the comp plan vote. And so the, the uh, agenda for that day was supposed to just be an update on Center City Partners. We're talking about maybe moving that meeting because it is just that one update from Michael Smith, but it does conflict with um, the um, dedication of the new Centene campus, which a lot of council members will want to go to. So if you're on that committee or you want to attend, please stay tuned and see when we will reschedule that briefing. Any questions? Mr. Phipps. You mentioned 30 million clicks. Uh, that's an awful lot of clicks. Uh, are we sure about that? Well, I only am telling you what I've been told. In a, they did report that, and we all were really kind of amazed at that when we asked. We asked more about it, and they um, were very proud of that. So wow. that's all I can say. <laughs> Uh, the last committee report out is workforce and business development, and I will turn that over to Mr. Bakari, the committee chair. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Malcolm Graham and Chair uh, Members Dimple Ashmere, Renee Johnson, and Greg Phipps. We met today. We actually had a very um, informative uh, update on the strategic employment plan from um, uh, Tracy Dodson and her staff. If you weren't uh, able to be there with us. Highly encourage you to go. It wasn't that long, but very important things were covered there to go back and watch it. The quick punchlines are um, this is a, a long-term multi-decade plan that um, the core fundamental piece of it is jobs, but it, it expands so much more than that. Um, but jobs are ultimately the key and the glue that hold it all together. And this is really something that will serve to inform all other plans going forward. Um, because those jobs, again, fundamental to the upward mobility, what we're trying to achieve, but part and parcel with the infrastructure investments we, we need, where transportation is going to be, zoning, Charlotte Water, Storm Water, you list it, everything there fundamentally tracks back to the jobs and what our strategy is to put jobs, good paying jobs with the needed amenities and wraparound services across the entire city. Um, so. Um, the other thing that uh, you'll notice in that presentation, and there's a deck as well that I want to make sure everyone gets, slide number 12 walks through what to expect. And I think we've been through the creation of strategic plans, so what to expect is very important. Um, so this is going to occur between now and the end of the year. It's been going on for over eight months now. So staff has been doing a lot of work to get us here, been talking to a lot of stakeholders, but this is the part where we're gonna start getting engaged. And you can see through this point, um, which will lead us in and through Q3, there will be various work stream, committees, task forces, places for us, the community, the job providers, those in, that have hiring programs, all of these things to come in and start to put their view into the plan. But I think the magic here is we're, pre we're creating it around um, a premise of the data, of the art of the possible, understanding what it is um, that is possible versus not possible and how it would work before we engage certain community groups that then can tell us and we can show them that data and before we improve the plan so that ultimately we understand how it would be implemented based on what policies we'd approve. That approval will, would start to line up around the end of Q4 and then implementation would begin in Q1 of next year. So the way I visualize this, and again, it's, it's really hard to picture it today until you see the actual plan when it gets dropped. There are three main dimensions to this plan at its most simple form. There are stakeholders, tools, and geographies. It's almost like a playbook. And when you look at these three in combination, you can look across our entire city and you can say, all right, well, what tools do we have? We know we have recruiting tools and workforce programs and TIGs and BIGs and all these other things and partners that do all these things. We have stakeholder groups, existing businesses in town, new businesses, veterans, uh, formerly incarcerated folks, disabled MWSBEs. We have that whole list. And then we have geographies, the corridors, um, South Charlotte, North Charlotte, um, Silicon South then, you know, as everything is evolving. So, yes, I did drop that name in there. So, if you look at those, this is the magic of this plan, which is there's no one size fits all to the entire, entire community. It is much of a playbook that says, well, this geography has these stakeholders that needs these tools. 
and then it becomes a very flexible plan for the entire city. And, and I will leave you with the same note that I left um, in our council meeting, or in our committee meeting today, which is a call to action amongst all of us, um, particularly the members of the press that are now with us, um, which is this is a community-wide effort. Everyone has to play a role in this. One of the reasons we've been able to announce USAA and Credit Karma and Robinhood and Better.com is because when they post the jobs, people apply. We have that, we're beating other cities there. So the call to action real simply is, if you go on robinhood.com slash careers, there's 34 jobs they've just posted in Charlotte there. If you go to better.com, there's 20 jobs they've just recently posted there, great technical jobs. USAA already has posted 38 jobs on usaa.careers, uh, or you know how the URLs work. Um, Credit Karma, 45 jobs. Lending Tree, who we expanded with before, over 60 jobs. Avid Exchange, who we expanded with, over 60 jobs as well. So luckily, that's when I went through, and then Fran from uh, Economic Development jumped in with something much more simple than that. The city has something called charlotteopenforbusiness.com slash jobs dash connector. Very simple, right? Doesn't get easier than that URL. All of those are there too, and they directly map over there. So the call to action, particularly for you guys, but for all of us is, We'll keep getting these wins if people keep applying. And how our great talent applies is they know about the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bukhari. That is it for uh, our committee report out. I'm sorry. sorry. That's it for our committee report out, so I'm going to turn it back over to the mayor. Thank you, um, Mayor Pro Tem, for um, allowing me to fulfill a commitment to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And, guys, it's really good to see everybody. You know, so it's nice. So. Great to have you back in the building, but more importantly, um, it's great to hear that more people are getting vaccinated and we're figuring out how to give people incentives to vaccinate um, based upon their age and their interest. And I look forward to talking more about the challenge that we've been asked to fulfill by both the governor as well as the administration, the federal administration, to figure out how our community, um, how Charlotte can actually implement incentives for people to get vaccinated. And we're working through that. So thanks very much for, um, for being here. And always remember that this is the time for us to take action and not pretend that everything is okay with COVID. It isn't. We need to do more and do, um, make sure that we get that um, immunity in our own city. Um, so um, I wanted to say that the next topic is not, is not um, should I say, very familiar to everyone. Um, I think actually if you talk about the clicks, I'm sure the 2040 plan has enough clicks to last a long time. Um, but tonight we're going to continue our discussion of the um, comprehensive plan. And I want to just take a couple of minutes because you are all here and watching. And I want to say hello to Mr. Winston and Ms. Ajmira. I hope that you are doing well this evening. Um, um, for all of us that are here, um, that let's just think about this plan. We've gone through a lot of community engagement. We've gone through a lot of technical analysis, and we've done a lot of work since this plan has been done. But what I think we should be most proud of is the engagement of the city council, whether or not this is something that we can work well around um, or how to get it done. I think every member of this council actually has read the document at least once or twice. And that is a pretty significant task that um, has been accomplished. Um, we've taken a deep dive into a lot of the key areas, and we've actually asked our staff to step up and do more community engagement, to talk to people that have interest in this in a way that we probably did not even think about when we started this journey, and it has happened. And I want to say thanks to all of the folks that arranged meetings, had meetings, and continue to have these meetings. I want to say thanks to the council committees that have met and again engaged around the specific languages, languages and the changes that we wanted to have. So we know that we're at the second draft and that second draft was released May the 20th. Um, it's had some time for the public to comment but also for us to gather those comments and for us to be able to talk about what's going on. 
And then I think you're all pretty much aware that the Charlotte chapter of the Urban Land Institute, we often call them ULI, we never really address them as their full name. They had a process that has been continuing and will continue. They worked with us to talk about how do we have more participation in development process to give us ideas on how community engagement can be very effective in this area. So they're refining their um, report and they're going to share it with us later this week. So again, this evening we're here to talk about the steps that we have taken and where we need to begin. So I want to make a couple of things that I would say is that I would hope that all of us could agree that the comprehens a comprehensive plan for a community is important, especially a community like Charlotte. We're still, I, I think the manager said that we missed being the 14th largest city in the country by about 3,000 people. So y'all keep counting, find those folks, and we can maybe amend our census report. But we are still 15th, but we're still the fastest growing, as indicated by the workforce development report, the work that we're doing, even in traffic congestion as a result of growth in this community. And these are the things that we're trying to work with to make this plan work for us so that we don't one day look up and say, how did this happen? So our goal is to um, get to um, a June 21st meeting where the actual plan will be on the agenda. Tonight, staff is going to present to us where those changes have been made. Um, and I think that there are two categories of changes, the things that council directed, as well as those things that the staff saw as technical changes and will present to us in, in tonight. But I wanted to say something else. Um, we know that the planning um, commission will be having a meeting, and I want to thank um, Sam, I think, for you're here to he listen and know what we're doing. The planning committee of the planning commission will be reviewing this and will make recommendations to this council as well on how they see this plan and, and what's going to move forward. But more importantly, I think that as we go look at this, that we've learned a lot about what we have done well and a lot about what we would do differently. And I believe that as we look through this and we start talking about that, the manager is going to give us with the staff and the team that's worked on this some ideas of what we can duplicate and what we shouldn't duplicate and, and other ways to do it. But the most important thing that I believe for this council that I've heard is that if we are going to move forward in this plan, that the city council needs to vote on how the plan takes its next step and that the staff should prepare for all of us the ability, and I'm asking the manager and the staff to do this when we have the June 21st agenda item, to be able to present the next step in a way that the council can, just like we approve resolutions around our capital investment plan, our compensation plan, but to approve a resolution so that everybody's on the same page on the next step. That is the one lesson that I've learned in this process, is that we have to have council engagement and acceptance of how we move, which is that I believe, if it's correct, we would be going into the plan and the place type process. So actually having this council understand what that means and how it takes place and moves that will make a big difference as we're moving forward. And each step along the way, the council should be able to adopt the methodology and the calendar and the schedule and the engagement that the staff would recommend and be able to be a part of it and feel very, very much engaged and close to the process. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our um, assistant manager and planning director and ask him to review where we are. This, this material will be um, a part of the recommended plan. Um, based upon tonight, we'll move forward with that. It's, I refer to it like I do the budget process, um, and all of us understand that we're actually asking the staff to prepare a document that will be approved on the 21st of June, and at that point, we will be able to um, make a decision, a final decision on this. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jayo. Okay. Thank you very much, Mayor Lyles. Appreciate that. Um, good evening, Mayor and um, Council Members. Uh, tonight, I'm going to share with you um, proposed changes that you voted on 
uh, that are going into the recommended uh, plan or that are reflected in the recommended draft plan that's currently online. And then there are four new changes that staff is bringing forward for your consideration into the next iteration of the plan that I will share with you at the end. In between there, I would also like to address um, Councilmember Johnson's question with regard to the deliverables um, and how um, we are addressing that um, going forward. Tonight I have in the room with me my colleague, Laura Hammond, who is actually managing our Unified Development Ordinance. Um, I also have online our Deputy Planning Director, Alison Craig, as well as Alicia Husband, who is managing our comprehensive plan uh, process. And so there's a few slides that I'll share with you, and maybe, I don't know, Mayor, how you want to do this, maybe I go through them, and then there will be comments, or maybe anybody can just my, ask. It, at, at our places, I see a copy. Does everybody have this? My suggestion would be to take the notes, because I see that there's room for notes on here, um, and we go through the first section where we talk about the straw vote discussions and then the com do that and uh, come back and ask questions if that's okay with the council. And then we'll start again when we talk <coughs> about the, um, the comments that were received that the staff has um, received after the release of the plan and um, do that. So if we make our notes and get through the first section okay. where we the, count, the staff responds to this is what we suggested and this is the final recommendation. Okay, so thank you very much. So starting from the beginning, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the items that you wanted to be in the final recommended plan is the preamble. I'll speak to this again when we're talking about the new items, but just so we're clear, we have a preamble in the document that identifies what's aspirational, what's doable today, and not only that, throughout the documents, we also have what we call icons or identifiers that will actually, when you're reading the document, it will show you if something is aspirational or if we need a legislative process in the future uh, to make that happen. We're going to amend that preamble, but I will wait until I get there um, to, uh, at the end uh, when we are having conversations around new uh, and proposed changes that staff is recommending we bring forward. So we have the preamble in the op opening pages. Next slide, please. Uh, the second item is uh, you wanted us to incorporate how public investments will benefit home ownership in the policy section. And so we have that as policy 1.7. Uh, what you will notice on each of the slides is that we also called out the, uh, the specific plan volume. Uh, in this case, it's the policy uh, document itself and on page 71 of that. Um, great neighborhoods, actually, this came out of great neighborhoods and you recommended that it goes into the uh, recommended plan. So the plan you have today uh, reflects that. Next slide, please. Same thing goes for uh, this number eight uh, voted item on sections regarding uh, storm water. Uh, we also um, made those references on, the, on page 72 of uh, the recommended plan as well, but also making sure that there's a tie into the tree canopy action plan because in the tree canopy action plan, we address the issue of storm water uh, extensively in that document. Next slide, please. Here we struck out um, a few things, uh, again, with regards to storm water. So what was supposed to be 1.18 became 1.20 because there were additional languages added. Uh, but this has to do with the 10-minute neighborhood uh, development itself, how we align that with our existing stormwater master plan. And the um, updates in the future will also make sure that we are aligning those with any time we update the city stormwater master plan. Next slide. Um, number 51 was to augment 10-minute neighborhoods. And so there were conversations around thinking into the future, it's gonna be beyond just a brick and mortar in terms of whether people go to grocery stores or they are delivered to you. So while we uh, um, amended the goal itself, we created a new policy that will address that. Um, because again, when you are looking at this, it's not the goal that you are implementing. At the end of the day, it's the policies that are being implemented. So um, we um, included a new policy on integrating emerging technologies and future innovations uh, in planning policy and infrastructure investment 
to facilitate delivery of goods and services um, on page 70 of the recommended plan. This, the um, conversation around anti-displacement, there are two, the next two slides actually address that. One is about the formation of the commission itself, and that came out of the Great Neighborhoods Committee. And um, the language is that the mayor and council should commission an anti-displacement stakeholder group. And that group should be composed of uh, neighborhood leaders, those who are actually threatened by housing displacement, as well as probably developers who actually work in this environment um, as well. Next slide is really about what that commission uh, looks like. There was a conversation um, around developing uh, recommendations of, during the implementation phase of the comprehensive plan, and so we provided two uh, languages that you all voted in into the recommended plan. One is to launch an anti-displacement study that will recommend tools and strategies that will protect residents uh, of um, uh, vulnerable communities from being displaced. And the second one was to continue to um, establish programs that will provide support for us to include affordable housing units when you remove single family units in particular neighborhoods. And so we believe that those policies put us in place to be able to protect people who live in vulnerable communities from being displaced uh, voluntarily, uh, involuntarily. The last one on anti-displacement has to do with the um, landlords. Um, as you know, we're not able in the state to keep a registry of landlords, um, but we actually have the ability to um, enforce how landlords really maintain their uh, properties. And so we included this in the uh, recommended draft to ensure that landlords, particularly of affordable housing units, maintain a habitable, premise, uh, habitable premises as part of the State Landlord and Tenant Act. We also heard with regards to economic analysis being performed prior to implementation of the plan and so policy 10.14 uh, addresses that uh, in terms of uh, how we perform an economic impact analysis prior to implementation of the comprehensive plan. And then there's a lot more detail in the implementation strategy volume of the plan addressing that. Next slide, please. This was um, a new one that came up, I believe, on May 17 in terms of uh, infrastructure investment commission. Um, proposed by Council Member Ajmera. And so we developed a language around that to assist in the assessment of infrastructure throughout the city and develop strategies that balance equitable investments in areas most in need, especially areas with absent and insufficient facilities, fast growing areas, as well as areas that are targeted for growth. So it's not just about infield development, but also greenfield as well. Next slide, please. There's also a conversation around strengthening language around home ownership uh, that came out of Great Neighborhoods Committee as well, provided this language in there, um, that we do have some of those programs today as a city uh, through our housing and neighborhood services um, department. And what the comprehensive plan does here is to strengthen rather than just say to promote. Uh, it's really about strengthening and expanding access to home ownership opportunities for residents. And the next language um, on the same subject is to raise awareness of existing programs that we have in the city today, such as the Down Payment Assistance Program um, through the House Charlotte and Community Heroes programs. I believe this is the last one around uh, strengthening of language uh, with regards to home ownership, and that is to create sustainable home ownership in vulnerable communities through partnership with banks and other financial agencies. And, on that page, you also find references to um, the CLT, uh, whether they be land trust or opportunities to land bank as well. So there are opportunities to be able to create sustainable home ownership in these communities. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. And then here we address some of the comments that came through uh, with regards to the development industry, whether they be block lands. Um, and then we can come up, we, we, I will talk about the um, height of uptown buildings later. Today, right, uh, the subdivision ordinance that you approved many years ago 
today actually has a maximum length of 1,000 feet. The comprehensive plan proposes up to 1,500 feet, but also has a language with regards to flexibility that blocks might be longer uh, because specific site conditions make new streets and street connections infeasible. And so we're going to look at different conditions, uh, such as topography, natural barriers, creeks, streams, and all of that. Um, and when we also heard about clearly defining what certain terms meant, such as mobility hub or micromobility, and those are in the, in the glossary uh, in volume three, what we may do is to bring that glossary into volume one so that people don't have to go in between to know what a particular term stands for. All right, this is um, probably the most popular policy in the entire plan itself, um, policy 2.1. Um, what we heard from you was to uh, carry forward what we have amended um, in the recommended plan, and that's what we have in the recommended plan today, which is to allow duplex and triplex housing units in all place types, but also make sure that we subject that to place types mapping as well as uh, standards within the unified development ordinance, such as lot size, setback, scale, height, parking, and orders. And that orders was really to be able to capture other things that maybe we don't have policies for today. But when it comes to the other things with, within the UDO that, we, that policies can support, I would believe that it will help us to uh, define uh, that particular policy very well. So that's what's carried into the draft plan that you have um, today. And um, next slide, okay, yes, sorry, this slide here with regards to um, industrial areas don't have to be concentrated around here, but I believe that this was one comment that came from the letter that we received from the development, um, our development colleagues. And what we said is that we're going to make sure that we are in, we're consistent with what the area, uh, airport area master plan actually says, which it does not talk about concentrating um, industrial uses around the, um, the airport. I know that there's a conversation going on right now between economic development department and the planning department to do an industry, a citywide industrial study, and that will probably help us to be able to also have a more robust conversation around where industrial areas are uh, throughout the city. But we, where the plan is concerned itself, we want to make sure that we're in alignment with the airport master planning efforts. Of town heights. Um, so there was um, a, a primary vote to eliminate reference to height restrictions, but that vote did not go through. But there was a substitute motion to actually carry that into the UDO. Uh, so remember that in the comprehensive plan itself, references to heights were never in the policy document. They were in the place types for regional activity center. So what we're doing here is to remove the reference to 500 feet um, in the comprehensive plan itself, and that conversation, just like we did for our transit-oriented development effort, that conversation can take place as we get into the unified development ordinance. Notice that that only applies to uptown, uh, that if you are outside of uptown, we believe that our neighborhoods used to be able to have some benefits that come from um, you know, buildings that are in excess of 20. You may really have that uh, in, in Island Mall or wherever they may be, but that conversation can continue to be had as we go forward. However, that reference has been removed where it pertains to uptown. And then I uh, believe last time, Council Member Newton proposed three different uh, policy suggestions uh, with regards to workforce uh, development. So those three carry through uh, into, the, into the draft that you have today in front of you uh, from 8.1, policy 8.14, 8.17, as well as 8.33, uh, which really, again, it's not just about community benefits agreement, but it really focuses on workforce development uh, throughout our city. And then finally, before we go into the new, um, into the new suggestions that we're proposing for your consideration. This is what Councilmember Johnson had brought up, I believe, at the main May 10 uh, meeting, and we tried to um, clarify it here, and maybe we have a conversation whether this clarification does justice to that question. Uh, like we said earlier, we're proposing that the final plan be in three volumes. I would like to, rather than be saying volume one, volume two, volume three, we'd like to really refer to them by name. Plan policy is really your first volume. 
and then the second one is your implementation strategy and the third one is equitable growth framework and where you have your place types manual and uh, we are no please keep, stay there thank you okay um, like we said earlier there are three adoption points in the overall plan process one is fully this June of 2021 where you actually adopt the plan policy document itself because that plan policy document is what drives what happens in the place types process without the adoption of that it becomes difficult to move into the place types pro mapping process but that place types mapping would take about seven months from the point of adoption of the policy plan into February of next year when you adopt it uh, you may adopt the implementation strategy volume as well as the equitable growth framework and place types manual volume at that time um, during the place types adoption in 2022 of February. Um, the UDO adoption itself will take place after the place types mapping has been adopted by Council because again remember there is the policy, there is the place type, and then there is the regulation, which is the Unified Development Ordinance. All of these things kind of feed one into the other. So with the adoption of the policy this year, it allows us to launch into a seven-month place type mapping effort with the community and council. And then subsequently after that, we're going to present to you what the Unified Development Ordinance looks like, because it's those place types that translate into the respective zoning districts. Like Mayor Lyle said, on June 21, we will bring forward to you what that process looks like. So I don't know if I should pause here to address this, or I should go on to the next one. The next, the next two slides, or four slides, are actually more of new ideas that staff is bringing forward that we are suggesting be carried into the um, next draft of the plan. For example, there's been a conversation and a confusion around where you refer to community benefits agreement versus where it's just benefits to the community. The community benefits agreement are only referred to in the plan five times, and they're only tied to potential tools where an agreement takes place between the community and the developer if they come up with that agreement as to what should happen. Last week, over a period of two days, Hoban Land Institute of Charlotte convened a, pan a panel of experts from Charlotte, Atlanta, as well as Raleigh, to come together and really discuss what that, re what that looks like. And there were about 45 different stakeholders that were engaged, developers as well as members of the community stakeholders, uh, community benefit stakeholders group. And we're going to be presenting the findings to you fully. We'll have those findings, but we're going to present those findings to you. It's our vision to be able to incorporate relevant findings into the implementation strategy of the plan itself uh, so that it doesn't just sit on, on a table or a shelf somewhere. But in the meantime, though, there are different areas in the plan where when you see community benefits, you automatically think it's talking about CBA, but it's not necessarily true. And so what we're going to do in the plan is to make sure that we had clarifying language uh, to distinguish between community benefits agreement as a tool and then reference policies and projects and programs that benefit the community. And one of them is policy 2.4, I believe, which says that arterials, um, four plexes can be built along arterials provided one of them is dedicated to affordable housing units. That's that's not community benefit agreement. That's just a benefit to the community that fulfills affordable housing goals. Um, there have been other references to different types of um, benefits that may accrue to the community that we believe that we need to clarify those and redefine them. So in the, in the next draft, you're going to see a lot of that clarification being done so people are able to make the distinction between the two. Next slide, please. So that's what staff is proposing that we bring forward to you. I talked about modifying the preamble earlier on, and that's really what we would like the last paragraph in the preamble to actually address the subject of what's next, what comes next after the plan adoption. The city staff will engage the community in mapping land use policies within the plan. The policy map will be adopted by council to provide guidance on land use and public investment decisions and the zoning districts within the Unified Development Ordinance. 
we're going to add that language into the preamble, but we want to make sure that you are okay with us doing that. We believe it's important for people right from the onset or when they're getting into the plan to know what comes next. And so that's going to happen. And then on June 21, we're going to share with you what our timeline looks like um, going beyond June 21st. The next slide is we also, we had a, a reference to three conservation fund in the comprehensive plan. And there was a question as to what exactly does that mean? So we are defining that extensively. That is, it, it's pretty much expanding what we have today, um, whether they be to acquire, protect, manage land for conservation of tree canopy within you know, the city of Charlotte. Um, it's, we have the tree safe payment in lieu fees right now that are collected. Uh, in the cities, during the city's land uh, development permitting process, and then we deposit them to really be able to help us fund our tree canopy preservation plan. It's the same thing other than we're just expanding it, and um, we're not necessarily creating another fund or something different that people are expected to pay into, but really expanding what we can use that TCPP for um, over the life of the plan and over the life of our trans, uh, tree canopy action plan. Last slide on this is um, really um, a language that was proposed to us by the development industry, but we believe it's the right language, and that is that the city should lead the charge to pass enabling legislation for state tax credits to facilitate and spur the development of more affordable housing. So those four, I believe that's the last of the four slides. What's the, what's the next slide, please? Okay, all right. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> Thank you. Somebody's talking you because your mic isn't on. Mr. Winston? I'm, I'm just sorry. saying if somebody was talking, the mic wasn't on. My mic is on. You're good. There's some. What? Oh. Okay. All right, um, the next step uh, in the agenda is to um, address any questions. I think that, let's, why don't we start on page one um, with, unless they're just general comments, would that be okay with the council that we just walk through them slide, deck, slide by slide? Okay, any general overview comments? I think that the new ones are also on a slide sheet and there's, you have two, two documents. And I have to say, um, I haven't had a chance to read this one, but we have um, adjustments and shows how the straw votes worked, and I think these are the same. Tie my eyes, and it's a late night to be reading little red print like that. So I hope that we can get them the next time in a little bit better. So everything size. you have on this uh, spreadsheet. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so what is the council's pleasure? you want general comments, or do, would you like to um, just go page by page? Yeah. Page by page, all right. So the first item is uh, the first items are going to be where the straw vote adjustments, and they're more detailed in terms of, you know, who and and made them and where they came from. So the first one, any comments on preamble has been added at the preamble to the plan describing the purpose and intent. Came out of the Great Neighborhoods Committee. I think it's consistently been addressed. But comments. Okay, so. Let's go to the next item. Um, item number seven, incorporate how public investment benefits home ownership in the policy section. Comments? Questions? All right. Carrying on, the next one is strengthen sections 1.9 and 1.18 regarding storm water. Um, and you can see through the implementation of the tree canopy, um, and it's also cross-referenced. Any questions or comments there? I have a question. Mr. Phipps? Yeah. Um, with regard to the tree canopy, tree canopy action plan, was this action plan ever formally adopted by council? Oh, thank you. Very good question. No. Um, the tree canopy action plan has not been. Uh, but what we've done uh, simultaneously has been working on the comprehensive plan is to start that tree canopy action plan because we wanted the information, some of the findings or recommendations in there 
to be carried into the comprehensive plan where appropriate. Um, it's really a precursor to updating the urban forestry master plan in the future. So you're still going to see that I will come to you at some point in the future. But it was based on um, meeting with several stakeholders uh, in the community after we had the tree ordinance um, adopted um, about a year or so ago. We launched the tree canopy action plan to make sure that we were having a parallel effort uh, rather than have the comprehensive plan take that on on its own. But it's really uh, a precursor to what we're going to do with the urban forestry master plan that will come to you at some point in the future. Yeah, because uh, I guess I was uh, wondering then, in as much as that plan wasn't adopted by council, the fact that it's about to be, I guess, adopted when we <laughs> vote on it, I'm wondering if, if it would be beneficial for members of the council to, to review a copy of that uh, action plan just to see what's in it, you know? Yes, we have um, presented that on a couple of occasions to uh, transportation um, and planning and environment committee as well as council, but it's not finalized yet. So I think the question is, um, can you distribute or email a yes, copy of it out will, to oh, all yes, the council absolutely, members? Absolutely, yes. That's what I think Mr. Phipps was referencing. Okay. The next item is strengthen sections 1.8 regarding stormwater, 1.9 and 1.18 regarding Oh, that's, that's an additional one for yes. the strengthening of those sections on stormwater. Any questions on that side? That, okay. The next one is augment 10-minute neighborhoods. Mr. Bakari. Um, so this will be like the third or fourth time I've said the same thing, so I'm just too exhausted to say it, but I'll say it one last time. We all voted yes, that it was logical and non-controversial to say by 2040, we can imagine that people could get groceries or other amenities, not by having to walk or ride a bike to them, but by just accessing them and citing things like Instacart, grocery delivery, other things like that. The same thing we voted on multiple times now, yet it says, the, the change is after it says a 10 minute walk or bike ride, then it says not all neighborhoods are expected to include every essential amenity, good or service, but every resident should have access within a half mile walk or a two mile bike or transit trip. So that was added and then new policy was added 1.6. If the future changes, which we don't know now, then we'll go and analyze it. So I'll ask one final time. It was real simple. Just say in the goal itself, all Charlotte households should have access to essential amenities, goods, or services. And if you have to say with a bike or a skateboard or rollerblades, then say or also other means of accessing them that aren't required physically. So I just am bewildered in not understanding why the planning director continues to fight on something that is so universally accepted amongst this council and not controversial among anyone but him. Okay, uh, if I would respond to that. That's okay. Thanks. Okay, I'd like, well, I'd like to know why it didn't get included. So there were two questions um, that were brought up. Councilmember Driggs wanted us to uh, define the intent and the purpose of a 10 minute neighborhood. And Councilmember Bukhari said to augment 10 minute neighborhoods, not the goal. Uh, we've listened to the transcript multiple times. It's really about how do you include emerging technology in how people access goods and services. We believe that eventually when you're going to develop and implement things, it's not your goals that you implement, it's the policies that you implement, and the policies are actually stronger. So while, yes, we could put that in the goal, it's actually stronger to have it as a policy. Um, I mean, if. If, since it's now saying that it's referring to the goal, which really wasn't clear in the request earlier on, it did not specify goals. And that's why we developed a new policy language for this. The, go the but goal if, is designed. Mr. Bukhari, I think Mr. I'm so, uh, if we're still going back and forth, I'd, I'd prefer to have my time now. The goal is designed 
Well, I to, understand that, but I think it would be nice and courteous well, to I'm, ask I'm, Mr. Driggs. Is it still, don't I saw the floor? I just want, all right. I just want to make sure Mr. Driggs and Mr. Bakari would like to have this opportunity to speak before you do. Thank you. Thank you. An apology for the frustration. I've just been having the same conversation over and over again for six months now. So um, a goal is designed to be our North Star and our, our, our compass for all the policies we're going to go build. So whether it was his concession to us to say I jammed in 1.6, the thought that we're going to go find this policy later or not is irrelevant to me. The fact that our North Star and our compass says 10 minute neighborhoods is designed by a half mile walk, a two mile bike ride or transit, 10 mile walk, bike or transit trip. It has put into a corner that I don't care what policy you've said, your North Star says those are the mechanisms by which the policy gets signed. And I mean, this was the least controversial thing that I brought up. So whether it belongs in policy or not, I could turn that around and argue 50 other points later in this that belong in policy deduction later on. This point was don't back us in a, in a corner with the goal that says you can either walk, ride a bike or skateboard there. Say that just you have access to it and we'll tease out the rest in policies. So this is a prime example in the most simple fundamental terms of how goals have been completely misused in this approach. Sorry. Mr. Driggs. So I just wanted to say, I think the critical difference here is that we continue to talk about a half mile or a two mile and these things, and then we acknowledge the possibility of these other technologies, but without the suggestion that our goal of a half mile or two mile could be modified by them. So it is actually an important distinction, and uh, I, I think Mr. Bakari is right. If we were good futurists, we, our, our goal is to ensure that people have this access. And if it's possible to sit down at a computer and make a phone call and have stuff show up at your front door an hour later, then that, uh, that priority is met. Now, there are other services that can't be delivered. They're not products. So, you know, you could still talk about whether they should be accessible. But I, I, I think I agree that this is not an adequate response to the point that we should be defining what we want to do in terms of how easy it is to get stuff. Uh, and and <clears throat> if it turns out that we're buying from Amazon, we're buying from food delivery services, and we actually rarely need to go to stores anymore, which is the direction in which we're headed, then why can't we say that our goal is that these things will be accessible and maybe that services or other facilities? Uh, I mean, the, the concern I've expressed about this anyway is, uh, and if you read the fiscal impact study carefully, you'll see that the consultants very clearly make the point in there, the availability of these services is a function of actions of people outside of our control. So we can kind of say that we want to achieve this, but in my mind, that proviso is not a minor issue. So uh, I think the suggestion that we're going to be able to accomplish this and we're going to get people who operate food stores to put them in all those locations and that everybody in all those locations is going to want to have food stores there. Um, but, but, but this particular thing where the intent, and I, I think the generally accepted intent, that our real goal is that these things are going to be accessible and not that there is a store within a two-mile walk and a half-mile this and a such and such that. Um, and it's, a, it's an example, I think, of overreach at this stage of our process where we are actually combining rules and, poly, and, and, and the sort of the legislation around the plan with the goals of the plan. And the goals of the plan are uh, more qualitative in nature, they're more aspirational, and then 800 feet for this, 1,500 feet for that. Um, those are th all of those are things that we should talk about later. And my motion on that point, uh, since I'm speaking right now, was uh, that we take those numbers out. And instead, the reference to those numbers has been softened. It's not the same thing. And uh, I think the difficulty that a number of us have experienced with this plan is it is so hard to get anything that was put in front of us modified. And it shouldn't be. Um, 
I, I think if 10 people voted as they did to take those numbers out, I don't want to see those numbers. They shouldn't be in there. Uh, and th this is kind of part of the difficulty of where we are right now. Uh, and of course, we know the big one is 2.1, but part of the difficulty of where we are right now is this council is trying to <clears throat> do its job in the face of opposition. We are, we are sort of struggling to, to get things that are put forward incorporated. And uh, so I think this is an example. I'll, I'll limit myself at the moment because we're on this, po this point. But I do have a general concern like that. I think there ought to be more scope for us to decide what we really want to do and not find ourselves getting an argument all the time about anything that we think about that might not be the same as what was put in front of us. Thank you. All right, Mr. Winston. Yes, uh, can we advance the slide to the one, uh, 51 that we're, we're talking about? Um, so I, I do think uh, that what staff has brought up does uh, uh, speak to Mr. Bakari's, the gist of Mr. Bakari's suggestion and what was voted on. Um, you know, uh, I, I would say that within a, a 10 minute walk, within a half a mile walk, that again, like I said last week or last time we talked about, that does, that does mean that you can walk from your doorstep to the end of your driveway to pick up that Instacart order. Um, I think what I hear Mr. Bakari actually asking for is something that he's been fighting against on several different elements of this, this plan. So I, I'm, I'm really kind of confused. Uh, what I hear you asking for, Mr. Bakari, is for us to make an aspirational goal to ensure that every person in Charlotte, um, uh, the digital divide is bridged for them to be able to access these future technologies that you keep speaking of. Now, I know that this uh, is a passion that you and I both share, that we both um, work on together, but I don't see how this would fit uh, into an aspirational land use plan over the next 20 years, the next 30 years, uh, to make it a, a city policy uh, to ensure that um, uh, within our growth strategies, we are paying or finding ways to pay for uh, 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 people to have, everybody to have access to broadband, everybody to have a tool, and everybody to have that training for the tool to use these future um, um, uh, uh, technologies. I also see, I don't, I, I, I'm not totally sure um, how you are rationalizing, you harping on this point over and over outside of trying to make some type of political argument where there is a rational way that we can create policy to say, hey, all citizens should be should buy into these business models. Everybody can walk into uh, some, at least some supermarkets like a Trader Joe's or a Harris Teeter or a food line without paying a fee. Uh, but when you do go into these Instacarts or, or Uber Eats or whatever it may be, you have to pay an additional fee to use this product. So I don't understand why we are, you're still harping on uh, the, the, the need uh, to push um, uh, businesses and business models to fit within some future policy guidelines that you, you've admittedly been trying to harp on for six months. It doesn't square with the, the, the uh, stance you're taking on the rest of this plan. And I don't see why you keep uh, trying to beat Mr. Gioba and the rest of the plan department over the head because there's some idea that you like, but that doesn't fit into our policy framework. So I think we should move on from this. This It, it, it does capture what we voted on, um, and, it, and it does it in an effective way that does do it in a, in, a, in a way through policy that we can work on moving forward to get the gist of, of, of what you present. Thank you. All right, Mayor Pro Tem, followed by Mr. Phipps. So I, I guess the question I have for Mr. Bakari is if, if the inclusion of saying all Charlotte households should have access to these amenities or to other amenities, and if it's through Instacart or whatever, then what would be the point in your mind of having a 10-minute neighborhood? I, I think that if, again, I totally believe that we should have aspirational statements in here, but ones that can stand the test of 20 years and allow us to build policies as things evolve. So if we want as a group to say 10 minutes is our goal, I never came up with that, but I don't have a problem with it, the goal should be based around us making land use decisions, infrastructure decisions, and all that, that that bake itself into, yes, access to those could be 
in Instacart today or something we've never heard of 10 or 15 years from now. The point is, I don't want to hard code specifics that we think today of walking to the end of the driveway for those any more than I want to hard code the specifics of single family zoning being something we understand. I, uh, I, I, the point is, I want it to be at a level where it's the Constitution and then councils after us for 20 years aren't backed into a corner and that's why I believe in the aspirational nature of it. However, I don't want to go so deep into the examples. I love to give the examples of Instacart because it's what we all know today. But that isn't going to be the thing 15 years from now. So we're designing the city in our land use approaches and our infrastructure approaches to be able to accommodate that as it evolves. And if you hard code in, in my opinion, things like you have to walk or ride a bike there, well, that just doesn't make any, any more sense to me then you have to have a Barnes & Noble on every single corner because people are going to need access to information, and that's how they're going to get them. It's the same thing. Is that, I hope that yeah. answers your question. No, I think it does. I mean, I, I see when I think about a 10-minute neighborhood and, you know, 15-minute neighborhood, whatever people think would have been the best thing. To me, it was more about community, and it's more about having access to grocery stores. So, you know, I, I think about conversations I've had uh, on the NC First Commission even talking about the delivery, the, the um, uh, you know, last minute delivery, point of service delivery, and how much more those trucks are using our roads now. So, so part of this is about people having access to goods and services, but part of it is also lessening miles traveled, not only by the people, but also by those delivery services too, which is sort of, you know, part of the intent of the 10 minute neighborhood. So I don't, I'm just trying to, uh, and, and to Mr. Winston's point, food deserts, you know, if, if you say everybody has access to Instacart, then in theory there is no food desert anymore, and we just know that that's not the case. So I, I you know, I just want to make sure, I hear what you're saying, but I want to make sure that the intent of the 10-minute neighborhood is what we focus on now, um, and I think we've acknowledged that the comp plan is going to have to be revised and will be revised by future councils as this technology develops. I don't have a problem with saying, even taking out the word emerging, integrate technologies, um, you know, those that exist now, and recognize that that is how, how people access it, but what's really the whole point of having a 10-minute neighborhood, so. I just, I, I, I mean, I don't disagree with what you just said. I think my, my point, and the reason I'm harping on this one is because I think it's a point the majority of us actually agree on. So it's not more, one of the more divisive ones. So if we could, our, a council 10 years from now could very well be in a situation where they're negotiating with Amazon as Amazon is deciding which city to roll out its first floating refrigerated warehouse that navigates the top of this city with drones that then drop in 10 minutes groceries in traditional food deserts. Then they point back at, we have a goal that anticipated this 10 years ago, saying 10 minute access, and it isn't through bikes or walking or transit, it's we want to go after that because it fits within our goal. So uh, to me, it was just super simple to say, the goal today isn't walking, let alone 10 or 20 years from now. So my, that was my hope that this was, this was a simple one, which was like, if you just take out walking and riding bikes and things and just say, 10 minute access to the needed amenities of a community, I, I just, I thought we had all agreed on this multiple times over that, yeah, it's not a bad thing. It doesn't say you can't walk or ride your bike. It just says there may be other options and we don't want to put future councils with their backs in a corner. Okay, um, we're gonna have to get those air rights pretty quickly if it's gonna be in 10 years. So I hope there's a, a transportation it, it, it will most likely just, be in 10 years. I know, but what I'm asking is our transportation people start thinking about it because if everything's going to come by that, you know, right now we have right-of-way. Our right-of-way doesn't extend to air rights and when we have these kinds of things happening. But I, I, was, thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about that. Well, maybe that can be in our strategic session. So, Mr. Phipps, you had a um, comment? Yeah, I don't know if it was by coincidence today prior to coming here, but there was a program, a uh, radio broadcast, uh, talking about how other European cities were uh, adjusting to the pandemic. And 
they mentioned, and I was quite surprised, they mentioned 15-minute neighborhoods. So I don't know what extra five minutes came from. <laughs> but <laughs> Pretty but, soon it'll be 21 but, minutes. <laughs> but they talked, they talked about the same thing. They talked about being walkable, going places within in your neighborhood within a 15-minute walk or whatever. But I see these emerging trends as uh, something, a, a tool that in addition to that uh, method of access, <clears throat> or walking or whatever, or biking, that we could still have these these other emerging technologies, drones or Instacart or whatever, they still can coexist with what we have here. So, so I don't really see, I mean, what, the, what this problem is, I mean, we recognize that things change and, and you know, that's, a, that's another tool of delivery, you know, and maybe an expensive one for somebody, but they do have those other alternatives. They can choose to bike, walk or whatever, take a scooter. So uh, I just thought it was interesting that uh, they talked about these other European cities in 15-minute neighborhoods as opposed to 10. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's, you know, if you can probably listen to it uh, maybe later on, you know, during this week or something, to, it was a pretty interesting uh, discussion, so. Miss okay. um, Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I think the broader issue, um, and, and I said it last week, that this feels like Groundhog Day um, because uh, I, I listened to Tai Wo and he said that he listened to the transcripts numerous times before developing this policy. So it, it feels like, I mean, I don't know if you listened to the transcript numerous times because there was a lack of understanding or if there's a reason that, that, there's, um, that you would be looking for ways not to write what we ask. I mean, that's how it feels. And it's not partisanship, and it's not race. Um, it, it transcends among numerous council members. I mean, there are several issues. So I'm sorry, you, you do a great job, this is a great plan, but there are other issues. And if there was a consensus among council on an easy issue, then these are the kind of things that, when they're not implemented, um, it causes, you know, the reputation of our council, you know, that, that we have some type of dysfunction or disarray when we're simply trying to get the, the people's work done. So I would just ask if there was an understanding, um, Mr. Jones or, or Tai Wo, um, if there are items that we've discussed, because we, we've worked on this plan as a council for 20 or 30 hours. And I know I have an issue that I had to go sit back and listen to a, a meeting just to, to, to ensure that what I thought was said was said. And that's just, it's not fair as a council. So my, my question is if we agreed on something and, um, and it's, it's not as we agreed that we all should be concerned as a council. Thank you. So, so Ms. Johnson, do you have a specific that you would like to have addressed by Ms. Mr. Jones or by Ty? Uh, well, we'll get, I mean, we, we can talk about it later, but I mean, I think Mr. Bakari's point is a, is a good point. I understand that. I just wondered if you wanted to talk about it now. Okay. All right. Now, yes, Mr. Graham? I, I, I'm, I'm trying really hard to follow, follow this, and we spent about 20 minutes on it, probably longer than that, right? So m maybe it does work, merit the time. Um, but but um, um, I listened to my colleague and I read with some paper, and I'm not sure there's a difference between the two other than a play on words. I think it's that what Ms. Johnson said, it kind of transcends I mean, how you perceive and, and the perception we, of how those words But we can go through, throughout the whole document and, and do that, okay. right? And so I, I would hope that we would really try to focus on the broad scope of the plans versus getting stuck on on wordsmithing or, or and that may be important as others so I don't want to discount that right but but the details of it right it's just the you know it's, it's, I think if we apply the the kiss principle which is kind of keep it simple and not to overthink what we're trying to do we, we, we may advance this but again every every man and woman has their own on train of thought. Okay, 
Now, I wanted to, Mr. Jones asked to speak, and I wanted to do that first. So, Mr. Jones? Sure. So, to uh, Councilmember Bakari's question, as well as Councilmember Johnson's question, I, I believe some of the confusion is, and I have the transcript in front of me from two different meetings. And so, it, um, you sit in these meetings with me, and it's not always crystal clear. So, I can painstakingly read through what happened in each incident, if that would be helpful. Can I, can I propose a different course? Well, no, I, don't think, I don't think that he was finished yet. I think he was just saying that's a choice. There's no more launching reading transcripts. No, I, I don't think he was planning on doing that um, unless. I was planning on doing it. That okay, then I, but I read it completely wrong. I didn't catch it. Okay, I thought That's you were going to help okay. us. So, um, and, and, all right, go ahead. I just and, I, and I can see where mm -hmm. this conflict is. Yeah. So on uh, 510, in proposing the adjustment, this is Councilmember uh, Bakari's comments, uh, quote, augment 10-minute neighborhoods to not only consider things like brick and mortar, grocery stores, and rather the means by which Charlotteans will get their amenities by 2040. That could be delivered via Instacart or drone or whatever. It's not baking and codifying into this plan the fact by 2040 it will require 10 minute walk to brick and mortar grocery store and things like that. It's a cleanup of the language in 10 minute neighborhoods. And then in 524, there was a bit of a back and forth which um, Council Member Vicari said, um, uh, Vicari on augmented 10 minute 521 vote was to change the goal, goal number one of 10 minute neighborhoods to verify, simply say access to the amenity is the goal, not necessarily a walk or a bike ride or trip there, a very simple ask that was crystal clear and what was changed, edit language about. So again, it was a what happened, why didn't I get what I asked? And so we reverted back, I believe, to 510, mm -hmm. which is what I read just now. Mm -hmm. So we just went All by right. what the straw vote was. Um, but again, that does not mean that we can't right. change anything, but we just focused on what the straw vote was, not the conversation. I think to respond to him who directly read my own transcript back to me, sounds like exactly what I've been repeating over and over and over again. And even let's play devil's advocate. And the reason why I've chose this one to die on this hill, because I'm literally, you guys can talk about all the rest, I give up on the rest of that. It's because this is the simplest one. This is the one we majority agree on. This is what was said. You read the transcripts yourself. And it, it, just playing devil's advocate, even if what I said was unclear, which it sounded crystal clear to me, wouldn't somebody call me? I'm a council member, one of 11 here. Wouldn't someone call and say, what exactly did you mean by that, Council Member Carr? Nobody. Nothing. Because they don't care. They want to jam something through that they designed at the Mr. beginning, McCarthy. and that's it. And if they can do that on something so simple as this, that's why I can't trust anything else in here. And more importantly, that's why we as a community can't trust the actual big step coming up, the UDL. Thank you, Mr. Bakari. Mr. Eggleston? I think, as a, as a, I think he had his hand up. Well, and I, I really do yet. keep a list here, so. As a, as a path forward for this, and potentially if there are others that we, we go down this path with, if there is general agreement that there was general agreement on what Mr. Bakari said, and it sounds to me, I think his, I think there's a lot there. His sticking point is that in the transcript you read, it said modify the goal to reflect and he doesn't feel that the goal was modified. He feels like there was a new policy added. Can we can we move to the next thing, allow him to write what he thinks it should have, what would be reflective of what he thinks we voted on and allow us to make that decision as a council again, refine, not refine the language by all arguing it out right here. It was his motion, let him write the language and let us decide if that is reflective of what we voted on however many weeks ago. Because otherwise, I mean, we could, we could keep arguing about the motives of how we got here, but if we're actually trying to modify this in a way that satisfies 
his intent and our vote, we need new language to decide on. Can we allow him to, to write it and we come back that's, to it in an, in an hour? That's up to the council. Um, I, I think that the question it can be. is... I just okay, don't know. Like, if we're run the meeting, just tell me. I'm I'm backing up. I'm just trying to just figure decide. out. Well, I'm, I don't. I'm open to suggestions. I just feel like if we are going to change the language, then we need new language to weigh. And if we're not going to change the language, then it probably does merit just moving on. I think the question that I would ask you is um, how we've got a lot of things on this list, and if we're going to wordsmith and ask for a change, I don't know that there's the idea of what we mean all being the same thing and I think that then I would say to Mr. Winston do you want to write something up and then do you want to write something up Mr. Phipps, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Watlington, anybody let's just figure this out we have to at some point um, understand I didn't hear disagreement I what I heard I thought was Mr. Bakari saying it's not written for 2040 it's not written for 2020 but I also know that all of us have said, while this is a 2040 comp plan, it will be adjusted in five years. And we know that plans have to be reviewed more frequently. That's how we ended up where we are now with a plan that's 75 years old because nobody talked about what is the next step. So I guess what I'm saying is that I don't know how we get to that point if we're going to do that this time, if we're going to do it with everyone that we've already taken a straw vote on. Well, I don't think and so. And so I'm not really sure what the Because the first four, I think we all felt like were reflective of, of what we asked for. And so I would hope that that would be one of one or one of two or three that we might say, well, that's not exactly what we were hoping to get out of the vote that we took. The others, we didn't, no one had any comments on them. We just said, yeah, that's what we were looking for. Thank you. So I, okay. But, but again, if we're not going, we either have to modify the language or we can just note that Mr. McCarty's frustrations and move to the next one. All right, Mr. Driggs. Uh, I think the reason this conversation is going on for so long is because Mr. Bacari was absolutely clear about what he wanted and what this says is not what he said. And I, if, you did, if you doubt that, look at uh, page 15 uh, where I said, remove block lengths provision for industrial sites. That was the motion. The numbers are still in there. And, and so uh, the, the sensitivity on this is, is just the idea that there is this resistance uh, in certain places and that things that we actually talk about and decide are then modified before they get back to us. And they should come back to us exactly. I mean, at this point, the book itself is a great piece of work and, and most of it uh, is, is not controversial. It's valuable and we will adopt it in some form or another. But at some point, we have to be allowed to put our own imprint on it. And we have to be allowed, as a group here, to, to kind of go through this thing and say, it's wonderful, yes, but. And, and not have every single time that we might have an issue with anything that's in here. It's such a huge plan. And this is such a monumental undertaking. And we can't be working in an environment where we, as the elected representatives of the people who have ultimate responsibility for this, feel that we are not able to put forward modifications to this plan and just have them implemented. We are past the stage right now where we should be debating or arguing about this thing with the staff. We should be talking to each other. And we should decide as a group, and the majority of us should decide as a group, but when the majority of us has spoken, I would hope to see exactly what we said show up. And I just think that uh, that, that is, I mean, these are just examples. The reason this is such a long conversation is because I think there's a feeling on the part of some of us that that is, uh, that, that that is representative of kind of how this has happened up until this point, particularly those of us who are not uh, in favor of proceeding immediately as the thing is right now. And the truth is that we are divided about this. And we aren't divided about whether or not we need a plan or whether or not we should adopt this plan. We're divided on a couple of points. And we need to have the freedom among ourselves to work out how we resolve those issues and uh, preferably not proceed on the basis of being deeply divided to adopt a plan that is going to inform the development of the city for 20 years. Thank you. All right. Ms. Ajmira. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. May I suggest that we just we just see where majority of the council is on this. If majority says it's fine, the new policy, the new language reflects what was in the motion, then we don't need to debate on this and spend another hour or two. I think we're not going to solve this today. We're not going to solve this no matter how many hours of debate we are going to have on this. I think we have spent enough time. If majority of the council agrees that this language addresses it, then we can put this to bed and move on to the next one. Mr. Driggs is absolutely right. Council should be discussing this at this point. So if we can just figure out where everyone is at. I have heard from some of them where they are not, they don't think this language reflects what was the motion. But I don't think I've heard from everyone in terms of their support. So I think if we can just get a feel on that, if we have six people who support it, we can move on to the next one. Thank you, Ms. Ashmere. Mr. Jones. So, Mayor, members of council, I think the Mayor Pro Tem's question is the question here. Is the intent to remove the concept of a 10-minute neighborhood from the goal? That I don't know. And I think that if that's the intent, then I think that's very different than the words that are here. But I'm not sure that that's the intent to remove language related to a 10-minute neighborhood. May I make a motion, Mayor? Okay. I think that the, yes, Mr. Eggleston. I make a motion that we amend the language to say not all neighborhoods are expected to include every essential amenity, good, or service, but every resident should have access to those amenities, goods, and services. Period. Period. Is that right? Okay. Is there a second to that? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion of it? Yes. Yes. All right. Mr. Winston. Absolutely not. Absolutely. This would be a horrible change of language because it doesn't put any parameters with this. You can have that 90-minute bus ride if you have to transfer to get to those things. Like a lot of people in Plaza that used to go to the Giant Penny to ride the 23 bus or the 3 bus and go through the Charlotte Transportation Center to get there because they didn't have any supermarkets that were accessible to them. Under that language, that would be okay. And that would basically, again, to Mr. Jones's point, eliminate the kind of idea around 10-minute neighborhoods. To answer Mr. Bakari's question from earlier, the reason why staff does not call you to clarify what you mean after you make an actual policy decision is because of transparency. That is your job, to be clear. And when you start to, this is the danger of wordsmith, right? If you just try to make it up at the dais and you don't put it into actual planning policy speak and legal speak, then it doesn't necessarily make sense. It is the council member's job, if they have policy positions and policy language, to engage our staff. In the particular department where we want policy changes to occur and with our lawyers to make sure that language will actually get us to what we want to do. In this case, Mr. Bakari and whoever else on council that wants to make whatever changes that they want, they did not do that work. They did not go to the planning staff. They did not engage with the planning staff and the legal department to change that language. And if we do that now, like Mr. Eggleston is suggesting, we are going to mess this up. And that is what we have been doing over the past several weeks, as opposed to doing the work to presenting your ideas in actual policy language. You put out these fantastical political ideas and try to make it a popularity contest. And that is dangerous. That is dangerous. So I hope my council colleagues reject Mr. Eggleston's motion, because if we continue to do that, we are all in trouble. Thank you. All right. Ms. Johnson, discussion? Yes. 
So we can we can look at this motion, or what, what we can do, since we've already voted, what we, we feel that we've, we've already voted on this issue, maybe as we're going through the um, changes, if there are any policies that we feel uh, as the motion maker may have been uh, misunderstood, maybe uh, Tai Wo and staff can, can go back and take a look at it and we can discuss it. Maybe we can table those issues so that we can move on. I'm not quite sure if we, we have the schedule for um, release to the public again next week. And the idea would be that um, I, I really think that this, the idea was take the information that you have today. And while it's not something that we necessarily have to change, because actually if you want to change it and you want to have the language ready for it, you could make a change on the 21st to any item. You could work with the staff and the lawyers to get it all right and do that. And if you want, this was the idea was that we, we spent as you said, how many, 30, 40, 50 hours of this? And if you look at the 40 hours of it, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but who counts? Um, I think the, the issue has been that the staff, just like in the budget, you have to give the, mat, the staff something to prepare. And this is what we voted and supported. Any one of us could, well, any one of the council could, at the time that it's on the agenda, say, I'd like to amend this, this, and this. And you can get, you have the time to do it. What we were trying, or what the staff was trying to do today was to show you the reaction to the straw votes and then the recommendations that they would put out to the public that would be ready for everyone to vote on on the 21st. And so I think that, I mean, we could go through every one of these, and there are probably, as Mr. Bakari said, things that there are going to be other places, and I think acknowledge that there are going to be other places that everybody doesn't agree. But I think up to I'll, this point, I'll withdraw, Madam Mayor. Up, up to this point, I think that My motion. I, I think I was going to. It was Mr. Eggleston's motion. I was just trying to help us move along. I understand that, Mr. Eggleston. He doesn't care. I'm happy to withdraw it. It happens as long like as moving, sometimes. As long as we're moving along. But I had Mr. Newton. I mean, Ms. Johnson, you, you, you get it? Yeah. Mr. Newton? So I, I don't know if the, the motion's been withdrawn, uh, if that's the case, and I guess we, we can move on. I, I completely understand where Council Member uh, Winston was coming from. I think he's right. In that scenario that he mentioned, certainly that wouldn't constitute a 10-minute neighborhood but at the same time I do think that we can have both right we can uh, uphold the the spirit of what's in front of us within this document right now and at the same time uh, include the possibility for other types of technologies that we cannot even contemplate today emerging later and I think that's what council member Bakari was getting at which is expanding the scope of this not excluding right what's in here right now but just expanding the scope. And then my next question to Councilmember Winston's point would have been, don't know if this is relevant, if it's now moot, yeah, you know, but it would have been, so when do we get those details, right? Because I do think at some point you do need to lock in some details. I've always, so I mean, we've been saying this from the very beginning, this is an aspirational document, even though we're told time and again that there's policy within it. Um, so I've come to accept both scenarios here. Um, having said that, to the extent that that you know what maybe was proposed by council member Eggleston was aspirational in nature there would need to be a time for some sort of more specifics involved and I would have thought that that would have been the UDO because I think that's what we've been saying from the get-go but um, but anyhow I'm ready to move forward if there is a motion if not a motion I'm ready to move forward with no motion mr. Eggleston do you have a motion who is who made the second to mr. Eggleston mr. Right? Newton did mr. Newton just mr. Newton did you just withdraw your second I'm happy to withdraw the motion. I'll withdraw my second. I just want us to either, I just want us to either modify the language or, or move on to the next thing. Okay, I think that what I would suggest, again, is that this document is coming to us on June 21st for a vote. Any person can make a, an amendment at that time, and it should be vetted with your lawyers, Tari and Patrick, and with your colleagues. I think Mr. Driggs is right. This is, again, a situation where if you want to change, You've got to talk to the people around the table, not necessarily the people to... Then I'll withdraw that. the motion and encourage anybody who wants the language changed to change the language and bring it forward for a vote later. That would be on the 21st. I'm going to be very specific about this. This is going to be on the agenda. And if you want to change the item on any one, you can say on page one point, page whatever, and point whatever, you can say, I'm going to... 
to request this amendment. Now that'll be a, a, a long council meeting as well, but it's this is why we thought this one would be pretty short because we'd have a chance to walk through the staff changes and then everybody would know where they stood. Okay, I think that's Mr. Graham's point, but um, it's, it's we always have to try to pull ourselves in a place that we get to keep going. So, all right, the next I think that I had the next um, page is page four. Um, this is the anti displacement commission. Any questions about that, Mr. Eggleston? Um, a couple, and it's kind of on both slide seven and slide eight because they're both anti displacement commission. Um, and I apologize in advance for one of them will also need to reference the infrastructure investment commission mm -hmm. just for comparison's sake. But my first question would be. What are, what are we defining? How are we defining the difference between neighborhood leaders and community organizers? That to me seems like two ways of saying the same thing. And, and then also, and I think this is on council, so I'm not putting it on anybody else. I, I don't know that in our ask we were specific, but I think we, we might need to be around the fact that the strategies that are created are going to need to be tailored to the specific areas that they're seeking to mitigate the potential negative impact. So in the same way that in the Economic Development Committee quarters of opportunity, each of those quarters of opportunity has a not one strategy that they're all sharing, but a tailored strategy for their specific need, their specific opportunities and challenges. So I, I think we need to find a way to say that the strategies that we are seeking are, are going to be specific and tailored to the areas that we're seeking to implement them. Um, and then just as a point of comparison, I guess my third and final question or point would be that the Infrastructure Investment Commission that we contemplate in on slide 11 does not necessarily try to call out who would be who would constitute this group, but we do on the Anti-Displacement Commission. So just for consistency's sake, I feel like we either need to flesh out who's going to be on the Infrastructure Investment Committee or we need to take out some of the specificity of who's going to be on the Displacement Commission. So I'm so open to feedback on any of those three points. Oh, wait a minute, I, I got two. Geographic specificity and composition should be consistent between infrastructure and, dis, and displacement and then, in the detail. And I guess the my first point could be moot if we were removing some of the language about specifically who's going to be on this Anti-Displacement Commission, but if we're not and we're instead fleshing out who's going to be on the Infrastructure Investment Commission, uh, then I'm I'm just wondering, some of this to me seems redundant. I mean, neighborhood leaders and community organizers and housing advocates and residents, I mean, I don't know what the difference, I guess, between a neighborhood leader and a community organizer is. Well, Again, if we're, if we're taking some of that out, it might not matter. I can't, I don't remember who spoke to that issue of the detail and I, um, we don't have to ask, but I think Mr. Eggleston's point is to, to include something around geographic specificity for noting that not all of Charlotte is alike. And then do you want to be that detailed in the appointment process? At some point, and we go to the follow-up and the next steps, we're going to have to define these things and they're going to have to come back to the council for appointment and, and that. So I think that the intent here is to say we want to make sure everyone in the community has the opportunity to participate. I, I think that the charge being written for these would cover those points, Mr. Eggleston. Mr. Graham? Yeah, yeah and I, 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 get, I get his point, but a, mm -hmm. a lot of these things are implied, right? Mm -hmm. That th these things will occur, right? And so I'm not sure that every step of the way we got to set the vision and then answer the question as we do it, right? I mean, so we got the UDO coming. A lot of these things will be fleshed out in more specific details. But if we try to flesh it out as we go along the way, you know, we're going to have 20, 30, 40 an hour conversation on every topic. And I, th I think that's what we're, from my perspective, that we're, getting, we're, we're trying to write the plan, 
uh, and 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 um, implement the strategies, the policies, at the same time. And I think that's where where some of the frustration, at least from, from my part, is coming in. That uh, I'm willing to trust the process, um, trust the individuals in the room, uh, and certainly um, trust the, the planning staff and the director to kind of lead us uh, in the right direction and counsel asserting its authority when necessary and at the appropriate time. Okay, so um, Ms. Watlington. Sure, so my comment specific to this um, really speaks to I think the broader point that I have been trying to make. Um, I'm looking at slide 20 and it talks about the three parts. I know we're gonna hear what the specific next steps are, but I think it's important as we think about the anti-displacement and the infrastructure commissions and Council Member Newton has brought this up before. I want to understand the timing very specifically between when that work is complete and when we move to the next step. Because what I don't see here is how we're going to ensure that we haven't already completed or drafted the bulk of the UDO without taking these recommendations into consideration on the front end. That is not yet clear to me, and that one is a sticking point for me. I want to make sure that the work that is done is input into the UDO, because I, I know you said that this will be done during the UDO, Council Member Graham. I would expect this to be done before the UDO because the UDO should reflect what the recommendations are that come out of that. So that's going to be extremely important to me to understand. Um, and I, well, we'll get to it when we move to the next one, but that's, that's what I'd like to understand before we move forward in regards to the plan. All right, I'm not quite sure where we landed. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, so that was my comment on number 19 as well. More or less, I think that's where you're getting to, Ms. Watlington, is that the, the straw vote was for the commission to be appointed to develop recommendations for the implementation phase of the plan. Um, and that doesn't seem to be what the final recommendation is. Do you read that the same way? Correct. That's my concern. I see a yeah. launch, but I don't expect the start times to be the same time. I expect one right. to follow the other. In that language, and, and it, you know, this I guess it gets back to what we're talking about. If you can't do it, then you just got to say it. You can't do it. It doesn't work into the plan, but because it's just so nuanced, um, but it makes it sound like continue and establish programs to provide support for inclusion of affordable housing units when single family units are removed, particularly in neighborhoods. So that's sort of ex post facto work when what the recommendation the, uh, the vote was for was to develop some recommendations that could be part of the implementation, not the response. Okay. Mr. Jones. Okay. Cool. Let me see if I can be helpful here. So um, a number of the items that we're talking about with anti-displacement were recommendations out of the Great Neighborhoods Committee word for word. Um, the other piece of this to Councilmember Watlington's question, I believe at some point in what uh, Ty presented tonight, there's this opportunity, and the mayor said the same thing, to, she's used the word resolution. Um, I think we have in here the preamble to make sure that we add to that what the next steps are in this process so that there's a great deal of clarity um, from um, place site mapping to that informing the UDO, but to lay out days, dates, and times so the council will know what the next X months are. I, I, I hope that addresses a piece of your question. Follow-up question to that. Um, before the 21st, we're going to see that? Well, my understanding is, a, uh, yes. So as a part of the preamble, we would add uh, Ty, if I have this right, a, a piece that maps out the next steps in terms of the process, uh, e even including what I would call the July um, look back to see what, you know, there's a piece of the July look back where we talk about what the process was and what improvements we can have, but also there is um, a series of steps that get you to the UDO. And I believe what you're saying is you want to see that before you vote Correct. on the 21st. Correct. 
and that is something that the mayor used the word res yeah, resolution. Yeah, I should have said preamble. Excuse and me. and there's an adjustment to don't do that. An adjustment to the preamble that um, that would lay that out also. Yes. Thank you. All right, Ms. Watlington, Anything else? Okay, Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Councilmember Graham, to your point, one of the difficulties that some of us have is that there is a, a, a difficult mixture of what I would call big picture and aspirational stuff with a lot of detailed stuff. So when we look at the detailed stuff, it sort of suggests to us that we need to be at that level of detail. And I, I think uh, to Ms. Watlington's point, what is difficult here is, is the sequence of events. Like, what is the progression from the formulation of a vision for the city and some of the, uh, the methods that we intend to use? What is the progression from there to uh, policy making and detail and then to the writing of the UDO? And, and I think what we're hearing, Mr. Jayoba, is, you know, the plan is going to happen then and the UDO is going to happen then. And, and we're trying to sort of understand the flow when a whole bunch of things that we didn't expect to see until later are already in here. Uh, and because the effect of putting them in here is limiting on later. And it makes us think about things in greater detail now that we really want to address later. So uh, that's why some of this stuff comes up about the wording because of the unevenness of the level of detail and policy making or rule making that's already in this document. And I think especially when you get to parts two and three, um, you know, are we going to go through parts two and three and then, and then do the UDO? Um, I wonder if there's a, a, an extra layer there that we don't even really need. I mean, maybe we should start talking about the rules. And in that sense, we'll have total clarity about what we mean, because now we will have the black letter language about what the ordinance is. So uh, there won't be kind of differences in terms of what we really mean by this or that. I think we have the building blocks. I think we have a generally accepted intent, for example, to liberalize land use, to liberalize land use in order to bring the cost of housing down. That's the thing that I think we could agree on. And then, and then you get into kind of more detailed questions about the tree policy. We haven't even seen it yet, as was pointed out. Um, so can, can we kind of complete or, or, or come together at one level and then, uh, and then work some more on uh, understanding exactly what these things mean? And that's, that's what I've struggled with, frankly. Uh, it's like I'm inclined to say, sure, you know, Let's just do this, no harm done, and then, and then we'll see. But I don't want to kind of have the conversation about some of the questions that are not yet answered in here from the standpoint of having kind of prejudged the context. I'd like to have those questions come up and to feel that we are kind of free to consider them not having voted on something that actually limits our choices. And so I, I think a lot of what you're hearing has to do with that. I'm very interested to hear the sequence, exactly what the sequence is and the timeline, the, the map, the UDO, the economic impact analysis, so that we can kind of anticipate what we will know at each point in time as we finalize a stage in this process. And, and, and I guess that's my general comment. So, so uh, let's get that timeline. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that we're clear that we will actually vote on phases two and three if, if we decide that we really need volumes two and three and that given how much of work has already been done on the UDO and the plans, we can't just proceed to those. We can save ourselves a lot of time because we're going to have the same conversation on phases two and three that we're having now and then we're going to have it again when we see the UDO. Um, so I, I just want to put out there the possibility uh, or to think about what would it take to just get this to the point where hopefully a large majority of us can agree on it because I think that message would be much better than having a six to five contentious vote. And then, uh, and then think about just getting to work on, on the, the language, you know, the, the, the actual ordinance, because at that point, there won't be any question about 
So do you mean this or do you mean that? And we won't have the kind of, well, we realize that that may not be possible. I mean, and, and sorry, but I just want to finish one last point. Uh, Mr. Manager, you said, are we hearing that the intention is to abolish the, ten, the concept of 10-minute neighborhoods? And I would say no, I don't think that was suggested, right, by, by anything Mr. Bakari said. Um, I, I do have a feeling that that concept is probably unworkable, so I have a personal concern that suggesting to people that we can achieve that is not representative. But on the other hand, I have noticed in our conversations that there's not necessarily a majority view around that. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I made the point. I didn't sense enough traction on that point to kind of take up a lot of people's time. On some of these other issues, you're hearing more meaningful uh, points of view that don't necessarily align. So anyway, if we could just come together around a, an, an, affirm, an uplifting statement of what it is we want to do and then get to work on doing it quickly. I think that would be the best thing. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Driggs. All right, the, um, we've gotten to, I think, ready to move to um, page, let's see, I get the, the numbers mixed up. All right, it was, that was slide 10, so are we ready to move to 11, which is infrastructure? No. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Which to. one? I thought we were on nine. Okay, we were on. What's uh, our next one? Next one is nine. We were on displacement, and then we talked about the. Nine. We're on nine. We're on nine. Okay. We're on nine, which is anti-displacement and. Landlords. Any, is, this came out of the council committee, and it's ensure landlords, particularly affordable, maintain habitable premises. So, um, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I have a question about um, about this the, the goal. We know that we're going to have more rental properties, you know, in the future. So, is there any kind of database um, where where renters can track, like landlords or property manage, managers, or some type of oversight in the city um, for landlords? There's a it's against state law. It's against state law to, mm -hmm. so it's against state law for the city to do that? Yeah. Register landlords. We as can't. landlords, we can't register them as landlords. But what I mean is oversight as far as, and I guess it's as far as um, excessive uh, complaints, yeah. uh, excessive um, fees or, pra or unethical practices, and, and maybe if it's not something that we as the city could do, is there an agency that, that could keep track. I mean, when, when people move here and they're renting, you know, there are property management companies and, and landlords that are really taking advantage of folks. And we, so is there any type of oversight or any goals uh, in, for, for us to be able to, or someone, to be able to monitor that in the future? I'm going to ask um, Mr. Baker if he can do some research around that. We've tried a couple of things, like registering landlords, particularly in areas where the rentals are in vulnerable areas, and it has not been able to happen. But I don't know the answer to the question. So do you know the answer immediately, or do would you like to get us some information? I'd be happy to get back with Ms. Johnson and the rest of the uh, council. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got some, some thoughts in terms of my personal experience uh, in this. It is very limited, as the Mayor Pro Tem said, in terms of what cities can actually do in that regard. Uh, but I'd like to get you a more comprehensive answer if I could. And can I follow up if it's not something that we and the city can actually manage, is there uh, an organization, an entrepreneur, a private sector organization that we could work with, you know, to provide, to subsidize or do something uh, because it's a need in our city? Yeah. I'll, I'll add that to, okay. uh, to that response. Thank you. All right. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, I'll just um, respond, Ms. Johnson, that we looked at this in the Community Safety Committee a couple years ago. When, C when the state took away CMPD's um, requirement that, they, that landlords register, um, and there, are, there, there were tools possibly to, to work with CMPD to do that because of the, the way they issue citations 
to be able to recategorize it in terms of the number of it. But I would, I would suggest it would be something that the Community Safety Committee would take up and maybe work with CMPD to um, log that differently. Or I can't remember exactly what they are allowed to do or not do, but there was a citation issue that they'd issue a citation, but it didn't ramp up if they had 10 citations already. So it's probably a good thing to handle in committee um, and explore that a little bit more. Yeah, even for maintenance issues, so we can avoid another Lake Arbor, you know, um, just, yeah, I mean, we did, we did go through all of that, and it, it just would probably be a refresher in a committee meeting. We'll uh, get, we'll get a legal idea around it. Mr. Driggs? Uh, yeah, okay. All right, all right, the next one is, um, yes? I just have one, Mr. I just have one comment. Uh -huh. Yes, Mr. Winston, sorry I missed you. you. No, it's fine. Uh, no, it's, it's Mayor Pro Tem's point. Uh, that's absolutely correct. We um, did a deep dive and we made changes to the minimum housing standards. Um, uh, that's something that uh, council um, did on it on our own, but it also coincided, um, as, as Mayor Pro Tem also mentioned, with some, um, uh, I think, some Supreme Court cases uh, that changed our ability to do things around hotels and motels. Um, but I think it is. Um, it is uh, in relation to that house, uh, minimum housing standards. I think there were some things uh, when we did make those changes that we did say we wanted to revisit. So uh, if we do go back to deal with it in committee, I think we should look back um, to the vote on that and kind of see where council's kind of uh, thought process was around that so we can have that continuity of work around it. Thank you. So we'll include that in the background information. Okay. All right, the next item is um, the economic analysis. Okay, Mr. Driggs. Uh, I further what I said before, uh, the sequence, like when exactly do we get that? Uh, there's going to be things in there that could actually change our thinking about some pretty fundamental tenets in here. So. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that we have that result before we lock in some of the other goals of the plan. Thank you. Now, I, I really hope that everybody realizes we're, we're stepping out here to try to do something we haven't done in 75 years. And if we're not ready to do assessment, it's kind of like, you know, you don't wait until everything is done and then go back and say, well, we need to go back to step one or two to do it. I think I hope we'll have rolling opportunity to say this is working and this isn't. I, I, I really believe that this community is going to grow so fast and so much is going on that we have to be as quick and nimble as we should be as a council and a governing body. So I think that you're right. It's like when and how do we make sure that we adjust it? And I would hope that we consider that in our steps going forward, Mr. Jones. Okay, the next item is, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Watlington? Yes. Yep, I just wanted to... Um, also acknowledge that this one, just like the anti-displacement piece, would want, I would want to see the economic impact analysis like uh, Councilmember Driggs just mentioned ahead of moving into some of the decisions when it comes to the regulations, um, just like the feasibility analysis as well. Because while I absolutely appreciate rolling uh, updates, I do think it is incumbent upon us to forecast so that we know what to expect and we can get an assessment of feasibility. Um, that makes a lot of sense to figure out what the target is and how are we meeting it. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So I think we're set some targets in that. Okay. All right. The next item is um, strengthen the language around home ownership. No. Nope. The next item is, I'm sorry, it's 11, which is Infrastructure Investment Commission. And I think that we've had Mr. Eggleston address this has a lot more context for the work and not the appointments, whereas the other one had a lot more work around the appointments, I think. So um, any, Ms. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, I have a question on this one in it. Excuse me, a question on this one, and it relates to, um, I asked Emily if she could um, look up what we had said regarding that 50% plus of our CIP dollars going into infrastructure in disadvantaged neighborhoods. And it, it just seems, I guess, I mean, Emily confirmed we did not vote on that as a straw vote. I thought we had, um, and that's why I was confused why it wasn't in here. But it seems like that conflicts with this. 
again, of having an infrastructure investment commission. Um, I personally don't feel like that 50% number makes sense to me because it's a, um, it's kind of an arbitrary number, but if we're talking about economic mobility, then let's help people move economically and not just be investing in specific geographic places, which could limit us if you have a company that moves to Charlotte and wants to invest in a certain place, but they're providing the kinds of jobs that we want to have, then it would seem to me that that investment commission hopefully would have set a, a guideline that said they could do that and we're not as caught up with where that investment goes as we are what they are providing. So I, I it's more of a statement, it's not a question, but um, I don't know if other council members also thought we had discussed that 50% number. Mr. Driggs. So uh, I agree with the Mayor Pro Tem. I had expressed a concern about the 50% number. I don't think we should have a quota. I mean, you could look at this as sort of like increasing our Carter event investments to 50%. And given that we're putting 25% of our CIP into affordable housing at present, um, we, we have some kind of peculiar implications in terms of our ability to do the other things, business investment grants and, and other things that we do with our capital dollars. So I actually like the language here that says that we have uh, an infrastructure advisory council and we should give them the latitude to, to sort of interpret our policy and decide what that actually means and reconcile our priorities. Um, and, and in my mind, there could even be a question about the legality of establishing a quota like this. Uh, if you think about our business inclusion policies and things like that, for us to just sort of say, this much money is going to be spent in those places, the people in other places could well ask, well, you know, without regard to the, to the kind of need uh, and, and the relative needs or uh, the traffic situation in my neighborhood. So I, I'm hoping we go with a, an infrastructure investment commission Last quick comment on that, again with reference to the fiscal impact study, it comments on, in there on the fact that we actually need to be more um, intentional about choosing our capital investments. So if you look at the commentary that they, that they added in their assessment of the outlook for capital, uh, they did suggest. So I'm just saying, you know, let's be intentional and let's let the capital prioritization be informed by our plan, but 50% is a very odd provision. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ajmira? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the language reflects the motion that I had made. Uh, it talks about the equitable investments in areas that are most in need. Um, and um, also, I think the 50% is a good number to have. Uh, as we know, a lot of our uh, there are parts of our city that's been left behind. So unless and until we make commitment to uplift some of these parts of our city, um, uh, I'm not sure if we can truly make progress. So I would like to continue to see that number as well as I, um, I'm very pleased with the language that I am seeing here. So thank you to planning commission. I mean, thanks to the planning department in Taiwan. I, th I think that while the number 50% is in there, it is not a quota. It's really aspirational. It's not, it's a number. Well, that's what aspirational there. numbers are. And it, may, it is a number, but why wouldn't it be 50%? How do you know what it should be? Should it be 75%? Well, how do you because we. Well, to me, I think the question is, that, and you know, this is where I am, you can see this stuff around the city. I mean, obviously, that we wouldn't be talking about opportunity corridors if we didn't know there was a need for infrastructure. So, you know, I think it's, it's disingenuous, perhaps 50%, but it's disingenuous to say, well, how do we know where it's going to go or where it's needed most? Okay. If you tore down people's homes, and the thing about this is, is this kind of goes to one of the developers that talked to me about this. You wouldn't need this if we actually had housing in places where infrastructure followed housing. But the infrastructure didn't follow housing until it was in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And so people that lived here before then, they lived 
by creeks that are dangerous often. They live where there's no tree canopy often. And I just think that there's a sense of um, that a commitment that needs to be made. I don't know if the number 50 is the right number, but I could suggest in many ways in parts of the city, 50 wouldn't be enough. So I'm going to call on Mr. Jones. He has to raise his hands, and I shouldn't have said that, Julie, about you Mayor. Know, but I don't really have any idea for you to say to me, well, it's just a number. It means a lot to people, people in the city. So I just, you know, it's, you know, sometimes we kind of be flippant, and we use these words a little bit. But I tell you, people watch us. And to be flippant about everything is just not really I wasn't okay. meaning to be flippant at all. I'm very Madam serious Mayor, about I, it. I have a question. Uh, Ms. So, Ajmira, I had um, Mr. Jones wanted to say something, and then I'll come right back to you. And we've got two other sure. council members. Please, Mr. Jones, then followed by Ms. Ajmira. So, thank you, Mayor, and members of council. So, I asked um, our budget director, Ryan Bergman, to uh, see what our investments have been in the past as well as what our investments would be over these next four bond cycles that still have not been approved, but they are a part of um, the outlook, you know, the 2022 calendar year, yeah, 2024, 2026, and 2028. So it's very difficult to say, well, let's back up a little bit. Defining what a vulnerable neighborhood is is probably the first thing that we need to do, right? Because Absent that, you revert back to terminology, whether it's the crescent and the wedge or things of that nature. So I think we have this great opportunity to define what a vulnerable neighborhood is. And I believe Wake County has a, a, a index of, of vulnerability index and has a bunch of measures in it. I think you would love that, okay? <laughs> okay, so, so let, let's just say that's, that's very important out front. We took a look back at the four bond cycles for the big ideas. And again, because I can't define what a vulnerable neighborhood is, this is a little bit dangerous to go back and look at this in terms of, let's say, the Crescent and the Wedge. But you have $784 million in the big ideas. And Ryan, my apologies to you. You just did this analysis today. So um, please bear with us. It's just a thumbnail sketch. So um, if you take out affordable housing, which some would suggest maybe you should, but if you take out affordable housing, adjust for that, and then you take out some programmatic areas such as sidewalks, traffic signs, signals, resurfacing, we have about 500 million. And then if you look at that $500 million, about 345 million went to vulnerable neighborhoods depending on the definition. So I would say if you just take a look at the big ideas, which had its own flaws, you could reasonably say that 50% of that investment went into um, the crescent mm -hmm. as opposed to this not defined, undefined vulnerable neighborhood. So I, I just don't think we're so far off. Um, looking back and looking forward again, you, you look at the $792 million for bond cycles, and again, you'd have to define it, but you know, right off the top, there's $200 million that's related to affordable housing, and affordable housing for the most part well, we'll leave that alone. So my point is, we're, we're not so far off with a, with a quick look, but, but I'll just put that out there as the council's discussing this tonight. All right, Ms. Ajmira. Yes, so Mr. Jones addressed uh, what I was going to ask. Um, considering comprehensive neighborhood investment plan and corridors of opportunity. We already do 50% today. Um, so I guess I'm trying to, if we can get a history on last five years as to what has been the investments um, in areas along the corridors of opportunity for past five years, and then also for the budget that um, we will be adopting soon. I think that would help uh, because I'm under the impression we already do 50% now. Okay, um, Ms. Watlington. Sure, so thank you, Mr. Jones, for that um, 
background. I think that is the crux of what a lot of us have been saying, right? The, the goal or the policy, the component that's in this document is really what you said. You had to have some sort of assumptions to go and do that assessment. And those are the things that we should be capturing. We know we want to invest in infrastructure in neighborhoods that are vulnerable based on these criteria, right? Consistent with the Mecklenburg County, whatever. But what we've got in the plan is the output that, until you just said that, many sitting around the dice didn't know what the building blocks were. And so it's that that when Councilmember Drick says the inconsistency or the unevenness in it, that is the struggle. If we're going to put numbers in, and I didn't receive what you said as flippant, I, I think what you were saying is we've established it's a number. An number. Yeah. Exactly. And we don't know where the number came from, but the building blocks that got to that number is what I think we all can agree on. So as we think about making modifications to this plan, let's figure out how to really hit that part because that's what guides the analysis. Because if we say we know that the goal is to invest appropriately in vulnerable neighborhoods, all right, well, let's define vulnerable. Like you said, we've got a benchmark for that. Then we can say what, what has been invested. We can take a look back and do everything that you did. But when we put the end in, in the beginning is where we keep running into issues. All right, Mr. Newton. Yes, and I would agree with that. I'm, I'm just thrilled that, you know, we are beyond the point of even asking the question of whether we should have an infrastructure commission at all. Because uh, I remember uh, that conversation. Uh, we have 33 boards and commissions, if I am uh, I'm not uh, wrong about that. I think we might have had as many as 37 because some are inactive, but not a single one for infrastructure. So I think that that's an accomplishment in its own right. Having said that, at the same time, I really do see uh, this commission working harmoniously with this uh, this uh, uh, this 50 percent number um, to the uh, city manager's point. I think you made a really fantastic point, right? We need to flesh out this policy. We need to define it. That's the work of the commission. And in so doing, uh, it's not necessarily confined to any one location, right? I mean, certainly we want to see uh, more investment in our corridors of opportunity, but it's not necessarily has to be defined to that either, right? That's up to the commission to do that hard work to, uh, to make those decisions. And we'll, I guess, come back with recommendations for that. So I'm on board uh, with both proposals, and I think that they work in harmony with one another. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Bakari? Yeah, I, I would just add that um, I think the, the macro problem that this issue brings up is that this is the tail wagging the dog in a lot of cases. In this case, what, aside from the question that's already been asked of what analysis has gone in to say 50 percent, an awful round number that is certainly not aspirational, is the one to be codified into this now, but who's been engaged in budget, in engineering, in Charlotte Water and Stormwater, all the places that actually build all of these plans up in how we get to infrastructure spend and CIP spend. Same thing goes on slide 19 that we're going to get to in a minute with saying, the, you know, at bringing in workforce development, things like that. These other plans and other parts of our staff, they have to at least be consulted. If not, the strategic employment plan from economic development is the one that feeds this plan and tells it what to do. What we've got is something that is far beyond a land use plan that didn't consult these other departments and put these measures in, then that, my friend, is the tail wagging the dog. I'm going to say that um, equitable doesn't mean equal. So 50 percent is a number that divides something in half. But I hope that when we are defining vulnerable neighborhoods, we look at need, because then that will actually define what the number should be. And it's not just because it's 50 percent over five years. It is 50 percent over the time that the city started growing and didn't bring everybody along with it. Now, for whatever reasons that may happen, maybe it was a lot of things. Maybe you just didn't have the ability or maybe you didn't get the opportunity or maybe there weren't schools for you to go to. But I would say to you that we've got to figure this out, not as a number, without defining what the need is and then looking at equity instead of equal, equal 50 percent. And so that's how I would see this. Okay. The next item is um, the straw vote on strengthening language around home ownership. Any questions about that? All right, then let's go to the next one, strengthen language around home ownership again. 
Is that the? S it's different. There, there are two su two suggestions on this. But is anything on item slide thirteen? Okay. The next item is slide fourteen. Strength and language around home ownership again. I think the great neighborhoods had a whole lot of strengthening that they were doing. All right. Let's go to the next one, which is. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you got them all in there. Um, the next one is 15, which is the adjustments around a number of these are around block lengths, changes in industry, consider changes in industry, recommended industry inquiry, and then establish industrial criteria and consultation. Any questions about that? All right. Mayor? Yes. Yes, Mr. Hands Driggs. <clears throat> So I've already made the point about the discrepancy. I, I, I think that's clear. But um, we also had in established industrial criteria and consultation with uh, industry representatives. Um, I'm reading this, and I, I don't see any acknowledgment of the vote that we took on that one, which I believe passed. Mm -hmm. So I can speak to that. I'm sorry. I think that was that was a mistake where we were playing around with the slides. We had had two slides, but uh, <clears throat> on this one, we had indicated that we have industry uh, industrial developers on the ordinance advisory committee that we're actually working with, like John Morris of Beacon, who are actually going to be working with us on this, because they're familiar with the existing subdivision ordinance with regards to industrial. We included that in there, but somehow because we were switching slides, that's why, so I apologize for that. So there is a method to do that? Yes. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Mr. That. Jail. But I just want to stress the importance of that in my mind. Mm -hmm. we, we need to try to get onto partnership terms with developers and, and not have this thing move forward in an atmosphere of, of confrontation. Thank you. All right. The next one is page 16, um, or, or section, or the slide 16. 42 in policy section change all lots to place types, and in policy 2.1 change all lots to place types. All right. Any questions about that? Hearing no questions, we'll go to item 17, industrial land and the air. I'm sorry. Say this, because I don't want this to pass and people be under the impression that there's not discussion going on around this language. Um, we've had some discussion. There's a lot of it happening, and I know that um, uh, the Planning Commission is going to review some language that we've been, that we have submitted. So we look forward to what that outcome is, but just want, I don't, don't want to give the public the impression that there's no conversations going on here. There's more to come. Mr. Bakari, followed by Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we've, we're once again, whilst the council did straw vote some things through, um, I, I think we're still very much to uh, Victoria's point in discussion here. I will repeat, it, it is still the best negotiation kind of middle ground concession for us to come to with a simple statement to say we're going to aggressively increase uh, density while reducing sprawl, keeping diversity, and have housing types, affordability throughout the entire community with a special focus on um, our most vulnerable communities. That's simply enough. Doesn't prohibit any of us from the things that are, we're passionate about keeping it, nor make any of us who want that stuff gone, gone. But I, I'll tell you, I am open, and I will repeat it the same way I did last time we met. My vote, even though there are things I hate scattered throughout this, is still there for a yes, if that's important to anyone at this point. If you remove this community benefit agreements, capital letters, from the whole plan and say community engagement, and then you take this and make sure it doesn't say single family zoning anywhere in it, because we have to figure that out. That's the work that needs to be done. So my hope is, Mr. Manager, we can come to a conclusion that that wording is t taken out, but doesn't back us into a corner that says, that's not something we could consider. It just doesn't give anyone a stamp of approval to go do it without coming back to us or to th make the community think that we figured it out and that is indeed the best answer. So um, I just, just once again, putting that out there. All right, Ms. Johnson. To, to negotiate. All right. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I sit here tonight as a representative for District 4 and as a voice to share the position of many of my constituents. 
but I also bring a unique perspective as a former real estate agent with over a decade of experience and a current and passionate proponent for affordable housing and equity in our city. For the record, I do not support the status quo. As we all know, the status quo only allows uh, current development of these units on corner lots. This is not what I am proposing. I believe that diverse housing types are appropriate for many areas in our city. However, there are also many areas where it is not. Those of us opposed are simply seeking a solution that will provide flexibility, options for protection of established neighborhoods, and a more sophisticated approach to future development. Please take a look at this map. <laughs> I gave it to a couple people. Um, as you can see, there, there are limited areas, only 33% where these units can be built. This approach will decrease home ownership in certain areas expedite gentrification, further increase the inequities and challenges to upward mobility, and widen the wealth gap in our city. All of this without any guarantee of affordable housing for those with the greatest needs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Any other comments? All right. The next item is slide 19. Um, new recommended language to support the city's employment goals. And you can see what those, I can't, you mean I stuck two pages together? Okay, Center City Heights, you're right, I did do that. I think that. we're on slide 17. We're on slide 17, I had went over one more page. All right, slide 17, um, industrial areas and the airport, industrial areas and the airport. Any comments here? Ms. Watlington? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I am glad to see the linkage between the airport's master planning efforts and the comp plan. I know that was something I spoke with the airport uh, director uh, about here recently and wanted to make sure that those two were working in conjunction with each other because they've done a lot of work over there. And, uh, I'm excited about the plan at the airport and what it can do to help make that area a destination and bring more amenities to the Northwest community. So um, thank you for that adjustment and I look forward to what comes out of that. Just so you know, um, Ms. Gentry and I spoke extensively today about that as well. I think the connection that will be very important for us to make is the work that ED is going to be doing on studying industrial centers, in term, uh, industrial areas in terms of their capacity throughout the city. So uh, we're working with them and I suggested today that we should bring the airport into that conversation as well. So um, hopefully we'll have a consultant that will embark on that, but yeah. Ms. Gentry and I spoke about that today. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Excuse me, ma'am. Mr. Phipps? Yes. So uh, in relation to this particular item, uh, um, I, I really do applaud the effort to, to uh, entertain the, the idea of some disbursement of some of these industrial areas that I would hope that as a council we would have the courage when those types of opportunities come up that uh, we don't uh, more or less get boiled down into some of the, uh, 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 you know, the disadvantages of, of not putting some of these places and, and instead of concentrating them at the airport that we would have some, some, uh, uh, some sites around that we can accommodate our workforce so as to not, they don't have to get in a car in the University City and drive our way to the airport that maybe they can have a hub that they can go to. So I know on several occasions we have explored opportunities and, and, and said no because we've had protests about air quality and all sorts of different uh, 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 objections to maybe having industrial or, or light manufacturing in certain areas. So uh, I applaud this effort and I think we should have some disbursement and uh, I look forward to to see if we really got uh, you know, we really have the appetite to really follow through on it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. Um, the next item is um, the votes on Center City Heights. Any issue with the revisions there? Ms. Ajmira. Ms. Ajmira and then Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So 
the new language does reflect the motion that was passed, uh, where we are going to be discussing this um, at a later date when the UDO is being discussed. So I'm, um, and I see that language around the specificity uh, and the number has been removed, and that is great. I know we had gotten a lot of emails about this. Um, so this does address the concern of more density in uptown area uh, while we continue to work on that in our UDO process. All right, Mr. Driggs. So um, for one, I, I think the goal when we had the straw votes was not to have a number, and now there is a number. Um, but, but aside from that, the, the concern I, I have about building heights is uh, if you have a situation where the market suggests that a building should be 30 stories high, market economics, and we say we don't want a 30-story building there because it casts a shadow or it, it's sort of a, you know, it's a bad neighbor, okay, um, then we can limit it. But if we say, sure, you can put a building there of 30 stories, provided you kick in X to our affordable housing, we, we need to be a little careful that the bonus system we have truly represents a bonus, meaning that it's an incentive and it's not a fine that you have to pay in order to build the building that you think is right at that location. And, you know, I think it could be a little tricky legally, uh, but, but at the moment, I'm concerned that 20 stories is arbitrary and that that's the kind of thing that we should be talking about later and, and at this point just state our goal of having <laughs> Uh, incentives for people to um, uh, that, that's available to people if they build and they contribute to this fund and not treat it as, as a sort of a tax or a penalty because it could be construed as mandatory inclusionary zoning. Yes, Ty, um, you wanted to respond? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Driggs. What we voted on was specific to Uptown regional activity center, not the entire regional activity center as a place type. So in the plan, in what you commented on, the regional activity center as a place type had two different provisions. One is that in areas that are regional activity center, let's say River District or even a Ballantyne or Eastland Mall, any other, um, if you get, you can build as tall as you want to, but once you hit that 20 story, uh, level, what are those benefits to the communities? There are certain benefits today that will come, whether they be plaza uh, or even traffic demand management that the developer has to even provide without any community stepping forward. But there could be some others, like we've had with our transit oriented development um, successfully over the last year or two. But the second part was Uptown Region Activity Center, and I believe that that's where your vote for. I think that. Um, folks were concerned about the fact that if you say 30 stories, which was what we said, uh, 30 stories or more, or 500 feet, that you are limiting that. And so we took that reference out based on the alternate motion to discuss it uh, as part of the Unified Development Ordinance. And that's a conversation we had with the development industry too last week uh, with regards to that. They understand that we're keeping the regional activity center outside of uptown to that degree, and we've had a conversation with our, our economic development colleagues as well as of this morning. But with reference to Uptown, that's where we're removing that 500 feet reference, um, so that way we can have that conversation. That's really what we were responding to uh, during your during your vote. So, Region Activity Center is not just li limited to Uptown. The 20 stories you see in there is not Uptown; is areas outside of Uptown. So the 20 stories is new or not new? It was there before. It's not new. It's not new. It was there before. All right. I, I, I would just comment. If you had a five-story limit, you said you can build more than five stories. If you put money into our housing trust fund, that might be regarded as extortionate. So, so that's why I think it's critical that we have a reason for where we, where we draw the line, the mm -hmm. crossover from the, you know, your freedom to build 
and then your obligation, if you want to do more than that, yeah. to help us out on our housing front. If you recall, during our transfer, I'm sorry to jump in, I know Councilmember Bukari wants to say something, but if you recall, during our transit oriented development conversation with you, we had, uh, I think, Bay Area Economics did some market suitability and some economic analysis with regards to bonus heights, and we came up with different options, uh, whether you do you provide units of affordable housing or you pay in lieu fees or you, um, I believe, um, I think it's contribution towards uh, CBI uh, or how you get minority contractors. It's the same process we're going to go here with when we get into the market um, analysis that will help us to determine at what point does it make sense for the business and what are those bonus sites. So you will eventually see what they are uh, before that becomes implemented. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Bakari. Yeah, I mean, this is, for those keeping score at home, this is yet another example of, like, a whole bunch of things that were irrelevant to the actual question, which the answer was, we all stood around this room and said, unless you understand what capping height, either uptown or outside of uptown means, don't codify it in the plan. And then when you do, let's discuss it, and then we'll do it. And what do we get back? Another example of fancy footwork and eight answers that had nothing to do with what we actually discussed. And I'm assuming some of us will have to go back to the actual meeting minutes and go prove our points again in the next week, of which I think several of us are just far too tired to do anymore. The broader point that I think can't be lost on us here is, is, the, is the double standard and contradiction that exists in this plan which is if we are a growing city, so rapidly growing, that we must at all costs have density, so much to the point that we must put it in this plan before we even understand it now. But we're only gonna do that with duplexes and triplexes and single family lots. We don't value density where it actually matters, in large tall buildings, uptown, or in regional activity centers or elsewhere. And if people want that, 30 stories, think about that, 30 stories is not that significant. And if we're growing this way, if you want to go over to 30, you've got to pay to play and mess with some of our other um, incentive programs by which we will extract value from you rather than us actually cherishing density as its own outcome. Okay. All right, the next item slide is, um, okay, no, go ahead. Sorry that I waited until after you were ready to move on to raise my hand. Um, on this one in particular, because I seconded it, I want to, I mean, I'm happy to just move that. Really what I want is a sense of affirmation that everybody's still good on this one. Because I heard Councilmember Ashmira say that the numbers were removed, but I see them here. I see the parentheses that says outside of Uptown, but I think there's enough, I don't want to say confusion. I just want to make sure that everybody wants this. So I move to keep the recommended language as is. I think it will come as it is written here. Right. In the in the June 21st write-up that we have, unless someone changes it on the 21st. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, Madam Mayor, um, may I follow up on this? I can't hear you. Ms. Ashmira? Yes, so the language um, where the number specifically is for outside of uptown and the conversation we had on May 17th was specifically for uptown. So, I, so this new language does not tie us to any specific number that we had specifically um, talked about on May 17th. So, I guess the number there uh, could be confusing, but it, it has nothing to do with the uptown discussion that we have had. Yeah, I think, I, yes. Thank you. Well, so to that end then, to that point, where did the addition come from? If, if what we were talking about was specific to uptown, and I see that in the uptown regional activity center, buildings that exceed 30 stories should be developed with community benefits was X'd out. Where in the conversation or in the motion did we talk about applying 20 uh, stories to the other regional activity centers? 
I think this Science is a place type. Science was already there, Ms. Washington. Yes, it was already there. Okay, so, so you underlined the whole thing. Yes, we okay. just underlined everything. Gotcha. Yeah, but okay. we yes. crossed out every reference to Optum. Gotcha. Okay, everybody good on that one? So let's go to 19. Recommended language to support the city's employment goals. Mr. Bakari. I already made the point earlier. I won't belabor it. The strategic employment plan should connect and inform the comp plan, not the other way around. But the other piece that goes kind of along with that is why would employment goals there at the top and, and workforce development goals be tied to CBAs? One, we don't understand CBAs and how they work. And two, that's the job of Economic Development Department and the strategic employment plan, which they've been working on for months. So. I mean, I don't. I, I guess this stuff magically appears. It's going to pass, but I just want it to be in the record that it's ridiculous that one department is defining every department's policy right now. Okay, thank you. Item the slide twenty. Separate plan into three parts. Did you? And I think Ms. Johnson, you wanted to address this. Did you? Yes. Okay. It, it, it's been updated. I want to clarify that it's clear that council wishes to vote um, after each, bef you know, before each volume is implemented. Volumes one, two, and three. Is that clear, Taiwa? Or, or separate the Mr. plan Jones? into three parts. Yeah. And, and I may need Emily to help here. I, I'm not. Sure, that council ever took an action on this I other than info, saying that council wanted the ability to vote on all three parts, all three volumes, all three, whatever we want to call them. And, okay. and we said it's absolutely your prerogative to do that. Because I, I watched the meeting again, and at, at four hours and three uh, seconds, there were five of us. I believe you had to watch it. <laughs> She called me, I'm like, I'm watching the meeting. <laughs> but at four hours and three seconds, we did talk about it. But if we need a motion, I'd like to make a motion then to, um, to codify that, that, if that's okay, Madam Mayor, if you can uh, call for a motion, that I'd like to make a motion that council uh, vote to approve each volume respectively. Second. Third. Okay. Okay, so the, each volume would be the plan policy, which we're talking about now. Uh, implementation strategy, is that the next volume? Yes. And then the third one is equitable growth framework and place types ma manual. Yes. Okay? Everybody good? Isn't that kind of what this means? Yes. Okay. Did we have a second? Yes. yes. Kari? Okay. Any other discussion, Ms. Watlington? Yes. Uh, help me understand. Volume three, Equitable Growth Framework and Place Types Manual. We've got that in front of us now. Um, we would we would we would uh, approve that, and then when we get down into 2022, the final place types adoption, we would approve that. So whatever discrepancies or learnings we made in between, we would just all right. Got it. All right. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Mayor? All right, Mr. Driggs. Um, I, I agree with the motion, and this ties into the timeline thing. So, so as we talk about this, at what points in time will council be expected to make a final determination about parts two and three, and there will be a vote on those occasions? I think that's what we want to clarify. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All in favor, raise your hands. And Ms. Sajmira and Mr. Winston, if you're on screen, if you would raise your hand. And we have a majority here in our space, so I'm going to call on Ms. Ajmira, would you please state your vote? I have a question. Oh. Um, so. <laughs> Hold on. We, okay. we're, she has a question, so. Yeah, I have a question on the motion. How is it different than what is being recommended here in the plan? There's no implementation a, a vote point for us in the planning director's prior um, in our last meeting, <laughs> there was no vote. You know how we took the straw votes that you can see on your um, slide that says 10 to 2 or 9 to 
10 to 1 or 9 to 2. We did not vote on this, and so this is a motion that would make it like the other 17 or 18 de slides that we've already discussed. She wants to know how the motion is different than what's in the writing here. Than what's in the writing here? Yeah. I, I think it, okay. Mr. Driggs, I'm not really, I thought it was the same as what's in writing here. Uh, I, I think there's some ambiguity here. It says there are three adoption points in the overall process, and that's followed by two, do, two adoption points, uh, reading the blue writing here. So uh, I think the motion is for the sake of clarity. I don't see any harm in passing it. Um, and and uh, it, arguably, that is what it says, because it says down below, council could defer adoption of implementation strategy two and growth framework three to the place types mapping adoption in 2022. I don't know that we necessarily want to have those two votes coincide with the uh, mapping adoption. So if we could just be clear that what we're saying is two and three will get adopted as a result of a council vote whenever the time comes. Uh, and I, I think that's the, the, the essence of the motion. So oh, Ms. Ashmira, um, Ms. Um, Watlington just pointed out it's instead of saying staff proposes to deliver the final plan in the three volumes, it would be and council will vote on each of these plans separately. Yeah, can I, can we, can I, I would like to hear from our planning director, Mr. Jayoba. So. Okay, and for the question or just comp general? Yeah, regarding this motion. Okay. Ms. That's been made. Yeah, that's consistent with our response there. Um, Really? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So I, I just don't know what's the difference. But the difference is that it does not state. It says staff proposes to deliver the final plan in three volumes. It doesn't say, and this is part of what I was saying that we should have on the 21st mm -hmm. to tell council when they will vote and do the actions that would be taken. So I don't think it's inconsistent with what we've been talking about on the 21st saying this is what we're going to vote on and council adopting a plan so that we're all on the same page. I think that that's putting it, I think Ms. Johnson used the word codifying it. Okay, thank you. Is that fair? Okay, all right, so um, Ms. Ajmira, and is Mr. Winston still with us? All right, Mr. Winston, yeah. no. what's your vote on this one? No. No. Mr. Winston is a no. <coughs> Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Ms. Ajmira is a yes. Mr. Baker, do I have to go around the entire room? Uh, on this, as you're directing staff, it's not. Okay. All right, so um, we had anyone else that would like to dissent from the motion? Okay, then we'll go ahead and proceed to put that in the final document. All right, now the next item is um, comments that were received after the release, and you'll have to help me because these are not things <coughs> all right, Mr. Janova. Yes, these are not the next four items are not they did not receive any straw votes. They are more like staff responding to some of what we heard from you and also from the community, and that means development industry as well, whether they had to do with, well, you need to make a distinction between CBAs and community benefits, or you um, tell us what's next in the process, um, or it could be define what tree conservation fund is or in additional language with regards to state tax credit. So those are just four items that we wanted to bring in front of you for consideration uh, for adoption, uh, at least into the, into the final draft, or if you feel that maybe they, they should not go in that document or should not be considered. Um, we, we, we did not want to surprise you eventually when the document comes out and then you see some of these things, but these are the four key things that we've heard that we're responding to. So they are more like staff coming forward with these proposals to you. So these would be things that would be incorporated because staff found it um, rationale and yes. reason to make um, cons 
these actions to clarify the document moving yes. forward. So the first one is at clarifying language in the plan to distinguish between the community benefits agreement as a tool and reference policies, projects, and programs that may benefit the community and allow four plexes on all lots funding arterials where the single family detached dwellings are permitted when key city priorities are advanced. Okay, Mr. Eggleston. Just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, Mr. Java, is this, does this mean that in different parts of the plan there will be references to community benefit agreements in capital letters mm -hmm. and also things that would be beneficial to the community but not in the in formal capital letter form. formal yes. sense of a CBA? That's it. So both, both of those will still be in different parts of the plan? Yes, so I okay. had a conversation with Councilman Bagustin and Mayor Pro Tem on this one, and that also came up in our conversation with uh, both members of the Community Benefits Coalition and the development as well, development industries, that we need to have that clarification as to when you're talking about CB as a formal tool or when you're just talking about benefits to the community. And so you're going to see that distinction made in the document. CAPS with CBA and loose language with it. I have Ms. Johnson followed by Mr. Driggs. Thank you. Is there a reason that you're using the same terminology that means two different things? I mean, right now we understand that, but in 10 years the council may not understand that. And, and again, it could be overselling to the public. Why don't we just call it uh, resident or neighborhood agreement? You know, we obviously support the concept of the um, the agreement like like we've talked about you know developers have contributed you know a hundred thousand dollars to Sugar Creek for in my area and three million dollars right outside of my area so we I certainly support uh, developers uh, contributing why are we calling it something that it's that it's not I don't understand the branding or that logic. Can you help me with that? First of all, in 10 years, I will hope that the comprehensive plan will have been updated or revised, um, you know, and different things could be the case at that point in time. It's the same way we use the phrase development agreement when the city is involved in a development, where if we have a property or money, we call it development agreement. In this case, it's community, not the city. And that's why it's important to make that distinction. Um, whether we call it anything else, it's important to make the distinction that this is an agreement between the community and the developer rather than between the city and the developer, and that's why we're making this. Uh, and community could be, you know, it could be business community, it could be residential community, but once you start putting other things like neighborhoods, it's easy for people to think people live in that space rather than do business there. So, and again, this is not a unique um, terminology to Charlotte. This is actually a national group called the Community Benefits Agreement Organization. Um, and this pretty much takes place in almost every major city that I'm aware of, and that same phrase, uh, Community Benefit Agreement. Now we could choose to call it something else if it's the pleasure of the council, but I'm just saying that it's, it's not unique to, to Charlotte. It's, um, but, thank you. But in North Carolina, can you explain um, from a legislative perspective what the community benefits agreement is and, and uh, the jurisdiction surrounding that? I know there was a memo from the attorney's office. I don't know if the attorney wants to speak to that. Um, no, no, I just mean in, if you can describe the community benefits agreement from a state level. I do know that it is, it is legal if it happens between the community and the developers. Um, we do it today. The only difference right. today is that it goes, like you just described, it right. goes through a rezoning process. But what about projects that don't have to go through a rezoning process? And so uh, there's nothing that says we cannot do it. The only reason that it becomes illegal is if the city becomes the agent uh, in that community conversation when we don't have any property or interest in the process. Right, so this is a city plan. And so, so I'm just saying why not use another, another word so there's no confusion. When we talk about keep it simple, it just, it, it just seems like it would be much simpler 
to call it the resident development agreement or something else, something great and, you know, branded that, that it, it is what it is. But, it, but the fact that there's a legal and formal and binding document at the state level that says the city cannot be involved with, right, that's called a community benefits agreement, it seems like we would stay away from that language. I just, I just don't understand the logic. And again, the concept of community gaining benefits from development, I absolutely support. I think we all do. I just don't understand the reason we would call it. Again, it's like calling something inclusionary zoning and we have an inclusionary zoning committee when inclusionary zoning is, is not legal for the city. So I'm just, I just, from a city perspective, from a branding perspective, um, from a deliverable perspective, I just seem like we would want to call it something else. Or, and I know we said we're going to be very clear. The language even says we're going to be, you know, very clear in, in, in describing what it is, but that's this current council, that's the current community. It just seems like we'd want to have simpler language for, for a 40 year or a 20 year plan. That's all. I know I'm not alone in thinking that. I just, I mean, is it? Thank you. What do you, you have a question? Okay. I'm going to ask a question. Go ahead. I'm not going to make a motion or anything. We've discussed this uh, numerous times. I just, I just don't understand the logic, and I don't know. I don't know what I'm missing. Thank you, okay. Mr. Driggs. I think the point about clarity on this um, was there's a certain legal intricacy here, and Mr. Baker, excuse me if I uh, try to address this. Um, uh, an agreement is a contract between two parties. Normally a contract involves consideration being given. So there might be a developer that agrees with the community, fine, I will build a fence and I will do all of these things. Uh, and, and then the community says, okay, we're not going to oppose your rezoning. That would be a quid pro quo type of agreement. Um, the city cannot enforce that agreement. So we have uh, standing to involve ourselves to the extent that we are a party to an agreement with the developer and we incorporate into that agreement our priority of certain consideration for the neighbors. And at that point, if the, if, if the developer doesn't do what, uh, what he said, we have standing to say, hey, you've breached our contract. But we have to have a part of that contract. So that agreement probably exists in conjunction with a TIF, a TIG, uh, uh, some sort of infrastructure funding commitment like we had at Ballantyne. And I'm just concerned that the way this is spelled out, and that's why the language said clarify, um, we're not being completely clear about what people can expect from this tool of the community because this tool of the community uh, benefit agreement does not oblige a developer to do anything. It's something that they will in enter into if they perceive that it's in their own interest to have that relationship with the neighbors. And as we get away further and further from conditional rezoning and from the council hearing process, uh, the leverage the community has to, to hope that the developer would be motivated diminishes. Because at least now, the way we work today, they have the leverage of saying, we're going to oppose. And then the developer has to worry about whether or not, so you will get a thing where the developer says, I'll put in the fence and we'll put it into the, um, so that's the thing that, that troubles me about this. It, it, sure, we can do them, and I would vote for the plan even with that in there, but somewhere we're going to come up against the harsh reality that developers are not obliged to enter into these agreements, that we have no standing to enforce any agreement that the developer does enter into, and that the real relevance of community benefit agreements, as far as we're concerned, is probably only in those cases where we have a stake in the transaction. So I believe, uh, good points, Councilor Briggs. Um, that's why we wanted to engage the Urban Land Institute uh, in the process to kind of spell out that detail. And uh, I know I only, I did listen to the summary of their two-day engagement last week. They interviewed 
actually they had 15 developers representing different spectrum of the development industry and 15 members of the community benefits group out there. And I believe they interviewed three of our council members uh, here as well. One of the reasons a comprehensive plan was deliberate in limiting conversations around the CBA is to give that group the opportunity to flesh out what some of those details may be. Uh, hopefully in the next several days, we'll be able to share their findings with you. Our goal is that the relevant, fi the relevant findings in there, from what I saw, from what was shared last week, was actually, were actually very, very helpful. It seems to me like both members of the development industry and the community feel that that's a very important tool. But we need to understand exactly how it's going to be implemented, how it's going to be defined, and all of that. We believe that by deferring volume two or implementation strategy to a later date, that's where you may be able to find some of those findings. Um, you know, so whatever you choose to call it at the end of the day, there seems to be a consensus among different groups that were engaged that they do want members of the community to participate in the development process. And how that happens is going to be presented to you, uh, you know, once we receive those findings from them. So I guess, I guess the, uh, the goal of achieving harmony between a developer and the developer's neighbors, but I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure who the person is, the legal person that we're talking about when we talk about the neighbors. Like, uh, we, we, we haven't really defined uh, who, who can demand to be included uh, in the CBA process? Is it with everybody within 500 feet? I mean, in rezoning, we have these things where we have to give notices to within a certain radius, and we used to have a thing where there was a protest petition. But in, in this document, the people who have that standing are not well defined. And in many cases, I don't think there exists what I would call a legal person who could be a party to the agreement. There might be an HOA in some cases. In others, there might not be an HOA. And now you've got an unconsolidated, unincorporated group of people that live around a location. And so uh, the clarity question for me was, was really mainly about just defining who it is that's going to be the other party to the CBA. I'll just put that out there. I'm not asking for an answer right now. Thanks. Ms. Johnson. Okay. So I went to the thesauruses.com, and if we called it something else, if we, call, if we called it a community prosperity arrangement or community improvement arrangement, like a CPA or a CIA, would, would that be the same thing? Would it, would it solve the same problem, or would we have the same outcome? I mean, I'll leave that to your discretion. I just, we, we're proposing, it's called Community Benefits Agreement. That's the best practice we know. Charlotte, again, is not unique to that. Um, it's done in any other city that you will look at that we compete with. Um, they do have references to it as Community Benefits Agreement. Now, we may choose to call it something else, but I'll leave that to you all. I think at the end of the day, the outcome is that communities, neighborhoods, whatever, whatever we call them, want to participate in the development process and to ensure that there's some benefits that they can come to some agreement, whether like Councilman Badrick said, it's a fence or maybe it's, you know, um, you call it a, a plaza or whatever it is, just to come to some form of agreement as to what, they, what are the needful things in that community that a developer will be able to do without necessarily having to have a financial burden on their development as well. So again, there are different examples. I think from what the ULI shared with us yesterday, probably, I mean, last week was almost 50 different examples of what a community benefit could be, from something that's very low scale to something that's very high scale. So as long as the outcome is that, it really doesn't matter to me what we decide to brand it. I just believe that the, the term CBA is very well used and very well known across the uh, development landscape. All right, Mr. Winston, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Johnson, did you? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Winston. Um, I was just gonna say to, to, to again, reiterate a point um, to, to Ms. Johnson. Um, we can change the name, we can call it a Christmas gift instead of a, a community benefits agreement. But what Mr. Mr. Jayoba is referring to is that this document, this agreement, this policy is refers to state contract law. 
and we can call it whatever we want, but if somebody wants to challenge it in a court of law, there's, there are certain legal um, uh, uh, steps that prove that something is actually something that can, that can be dealt with. So we can go to, that's why we don't change policy by going to thesaurus.com, but we go and work with staff, our legal department, and our planning department in this case, to create a new policy idea to bring to the table um, if that is what we actually want to do. We get in very much trouble if we think that we're going to change policy or, or uh, evade legal statutes simply by changing the name. Uh, again, uh, you put lipstick on a pig, uh, it, it doesn't make that, uh, the, the, uh, it's something else, it's still a pig. So um, let's just be careful on, when we're doing things uh, by trying to change um, uh, policy by going to things like thesaurus.com. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, can I respond? Wait, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Mr. Bakari, Bakari was. And, and Mr. Phipps, are you? Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, Mr. Bakari, followed by Mr. Phipps, and then we'll come back yeah, to I, those that have spoken, at least. I, I think it's. I think Ms. Johnson is on to the crux of the very debate we've been having on CBAs for multiple months, and I think Councilman Winston is articulating right now the fancy footwork that we've been given every time we ask this exact same question. If everyone is indeed saying what the planning director just said, which is, oh yeah, we could change it and call it whatever you want, why wouldn't they have done that months ago? They would, that we would have been, we wouldn't be debating this anymore. I've said crisply, month over month, if you change it to say benefits to the community, you have my vote. Yet no one moves there, and other people other than me are asking that question. And the crux of it is this. If Councilman Winston, with his argument he just made, is, well, you can call it whatever you want, we can't get around the legal challenges of somebody saying, well, this is exactly what you're doing, you can call it something else, but you're trying to bypass the law, that is the crux of this. They want it to be CBAs because they have ulterior motives to make it CBAs. They know they're illegal, so they try to say, well, it's not that, but it is. But that's why we have to keep, listen to what they're doing, not what they're saying. And what they're doing is keeping the language in here, talking to us with answers that take 45 minutes to give it back to us, but it has nothing to do with, yes, we are all for community benefits in this room, but a very small group of them, two of which we've been hearing from directly on this, want these particular capital CBAs in here that are highly disputed, and then there is a group of activists nationwide that are pushing them when we just want what's best for Charlotte here. So if you want to know why, look at what they're doing, not what they're saying. They're keeping it in there and saying, we could change it to anything. If you could change it to anything, you would have avoided this whole disaster and dumpster fire for the last several months and already done it. Um, I think we, who is the next speaker? I'm sorry, after Mr. Mr. Phipps. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna cover another topic, but if, <laughs> well. if, 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 if we're still on this uh, CBAs, then I think, you know, we should stay with the CBAs, and I can ask my question after we finish it, you know. Uh, Ms. Johnson? I just don't see why everyone doesn't have the same question. It's just bizarre to me. But, okay, let me, and we can work this out behind the scenes, but I just, I just want a, a, a clear answer. If we call this something else, we would have the same outcome. Is that correct? As long as you define the outcome, yes. Yeah, and, and, and that's not, and there is also a CBA process that's a formal legal binding process that Raleigh says that we as the city cannot um, implement, correct? I wish I had, we'd use like visual aids, but CBA, capital letters, is illegal for the city of Charlotte to be a part of, correct? Unless we have public land The city of Charlotte. We know that the concept of a, a community negotiation is not illegal, or if it's between the developer and the residents, we know that. But the city of Charlotte cannot be involved in developing CBAs. It can't impose one. Can't it impose. can't impose one on other parties. It could be a party to one if it was in our interest to do so. Correct me if I'm wrong, lawyers, but... We cannot inflict that agreement on, on, on a developer and a community and okay, require the developer to enter that into we it. we are not a party to. Okay, I just, well, I just want to make sure that we're all clear on that and so I don't like understand 
why we would want to pass a, um, a plan that, that lists something that we know that it's not our council members, my fellow council members. That's all. And, and, as, and again, we're not, I'm not opposed. I think you all, my constituents know how, fight, how hard I fight for residents and communities that I'm not against uh, improvements. So I like the term CIA or CPA, but we'll get back with you on that. Thank you. All right. The next one is um, 22, and it's the preamble, and I think we've talked about this, which is that uh, the policy will be adopted by council to provide guidance, and I think that this one is to continue with the plan. Is this the preamble we were talking about? Mayor, I think we'll have to expand it a little bit more than okay. what you have here. So it'll be expanded to yes. represent prior decisions. All right, the next one is um, Tree Conservation Fund. Any questions regarding that, aside from the fact that we are going to get a copy of the draft? And I would assume that means that, um, has that been in a committee or has it been an advisory group? Has it been in your committee, Julie? Uh, no. So I think we probably need to get a referral in there pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. All right, the next item is um, the um, strengthen again affordable housing, um, lead the charge to facilitate the legislation for state tax credits and spur development of more affordable housing. Along with our other strategies, it's just another strategy to work with the state or to lobby the state for that. Okay, we've gotten through all of the... Could you say that one more time? Let me read that. I just want to make sure. I have one comment about that. Yeah. All right, so this is lead the charge to pass enabling legislation for the state for state tax credits to facilitate and spur the development of more affordable housing. Um, the state doesn't do tax credits right now, is my understanding. So we have the federal tax credits that they get, and they put in their agency for financing, and that's what supplies, but they do not have a separate. So, so I think that's my understanding. So we're not taking out any language relating to affordable housing or this is added. This is added. We're not taking Adding it. Yes. No, it's an added. I it's see. another tool. Okay. Just want to make sure. I do want you to know that um, I have asked um, the federal level to um, also look into um, some of the locational restrictions they have for the use of those federal tax credits and to try to modify those so that we are able to build more affordable housing as well. Okay. I have a comment about, Ms. about Mr. Winston. Yes, please. Yes. So I, I'm I, I'm completely for uh, this final rec uh, recommendation around the state tax credits. Um, I, I just would, you know, the way I read this and the implications of this, this would put a standing item on our state legislative agenda, uh, being that it would say that we should lead on this and that it doesn't exist. That would be something that we would lobby uh, our our delegates for. An, every time until we actually got that. That's that's the mandate that I'm reading into this. Should we pass it? Is, should I be incorrect? In I, I, I agree that um, whatever it is we need to be doing, and as soon as we get something in some research that writes it or it does the research into it, I think we need to figure out what we're asking for specifically. But I do think that if council approves that, it's kind of like our citizens review board. We just keep on working at it. Subpoena power, sorry. That's what I was, I know. All right, um, thank yes, you. Yes, uh, I, uh, Ms., wait a minute, we have oh, Mr. Somebody, Phipps. Yeah, I, I wanted to get to my, I had a general question okay. about the responses to, I guess, certain um, submissions by the industry. I was made aware that um, a lot of responses that came back and they didn't consider them to be real responses was, that we are supposed to be the council okay. would supposed to be asking or you all you planning would, uh, was supposed to be asking council to direct them to do something and so and we got pages of some of these responses but uh, my question is how would we know or how would all of the council members know what 
to direct you to do if they didn't have these particular documents in front of them. So, so did did you did planning go in and 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 answer these questions? Because all I see is that you are going to ask us to direct you to answer these questions. So that's what I was. I'm trying to get a, a clarification on. So I don't know which one you're referring to. Well, I mean, it's. I know that it, you know uh, we probably received it in in the hundreds of. Uh, packets of uh, responses that we've gotten, but... That was a five-page memo. That well, was, that I was think the uh, this might have been a five-page memo of... Yes. Uh, I think that's, a, that's the most recent one we received from the development industry. Uh -huh. So, Manager Jones and I went through the responses with them on Tuesday afternoon last week. Some of those responses are actually reflected in a couple of those new proposed um, languages here today. One regarding clarification. Uh, one regarding tree conservation fund. I think the other one on the strengthening affordable housing to lead the charge, those three are examples that came from the development industry. The others were more focused on place types, um, manual, and some of the comments there uh, with regards to whether it's a community center or neighborhood center and how we define them. So we walked through some of those with them and I think I sent a summary to you all of what we discussed. Um, if you go back and take a look at the summary, maybe there are certain aspects that you feel that, well, Tywo, we did not talk about this. I'd be glad to, to discuss that. But one of the things that we clearly mentioned to them, especially with regards to CBA, was let's wait until the ULI work is done, and then we'll make sure that we reflect the relevant findings in the implementation strategy, and they wanted us to get back together after that. So again, I think it's a, an ongoing conversation. Uh, with the community that we'll continue to have. And I will be mindful to say that adopting the plan is not the end of the process. Um, we will still have opportunities to engage. Um, there are communities where you adopt the plan and within one year you've got five different amendments to the plan. Because again, hindsight is always perfect, right? As you move forward and as you look at your plan and as you look at things changing, the reason it's a living document is that you can revisit that plan and have a one, two page amendment to it. Um, I think Raleigh had five within the first one year. And so it's very important to keep that in mind that as we go forward, there are things that you would discuss that we will be listening to and be mindful of, such as what you're hearing from the community or the development industry that we have to keep in mind for future updates to the plan. Yes. Thank you. Me. Oh, I think I have, I have Ms. Ejmira first, and then you, Ms. Johnson, and Mr. Bakari. Ms. Ejmira? Yes. My question is on this slide number 23, the one before this. So I can hold my question till this slide, the discussion is over. Okay. I think we are moving on. So go ahead with your question. Okay. Can we go to slide number 23, please? Which number? 23, 23 on, T, uh, yeah, on the, the tree, tree kind of conservation yeah, fund. Tree yes. conservation fund. Okay, so there is, no, I just wanna make sure Mr. Jaroba, so nothing has changed. All you're doing is just providing the definition of what the tree conservation fund is. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Let's say we're providing, and because someone sees tree conservation fund, they think it means we're creating another bucket. Um, but what we're saying is that it's really what you have today with your TCPP, just expanding the usage of that. I'm sorry, expanding? Expanding what? the usage of that and then consolidating your tree canopy mitigation and the payment in lieu fees into one fund. And then it, that results in streamlining the permitting process. So it's not a new thing as much as it's what you have today that we are leveraging. Okay, so does that mean, so currently the TCPP can only be used to acquire land mm -hmm. um, to preserve and protect uh, tree canopy. So are we expanding the use here to do more with that fund? Especially for management of it, yes. Okay, when you say management of it, tell me more because uh, I'm concerned because we already have 
we don't we don't have enough TCPP fund. So if you're going to expand the use here, uh, how would that affect the amount or the acreage we currently buy? What would what impact would it have on uh, our acquisition of properties? So um, at this point, I don't know if Harley St. Craig is still on. I will defer to her uh, on this particular subject. Hi, um, I'm, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you, Alison. Thank you. So I think really what this is doing is allowing additional flexibility in how the funds are used. Um, and so um, I don't think that it's allowing us to acquire more properties, but it's allowing us to be able to have more flexibility in how we apply those funds to, um, whether it's acquiring different properties or it's um, uh, planting more trees, things like that. Yeah, so that that's where I have concerns with because the intent of TCPP was to acquire more acreage so that we can preserve and protect our tree canopy uh, as developers are paying into this fund. So if you're going to start using this fund for something else and provide more flexibility, I'm concerned that we are not going to be able to save as much acreage uh, that we are currently doing. So. I'm so I just need more clarity on this. Okay. Um, how would that impact our acquisition and the acreage that we are buying currently? So that, that's something that, that uh, Tim Porter, who is our chief urban forester, um, we're happy to talk to you more about. Those are policies um, and ordinance language that are still under development right now. And so we can certainly talk with you more about that and, and make some, um, create some different directions on that. Yeah, so um, I guess I don't want us to then put this in the language because then this sets in stone. Uh, I, I, if the flexibility is coming at the cost of less acreage, then I, I'm, I don't support this. Quick question. So I just want to make that very clear. The intent of this TCPP was to acquire land, and that's why developers pay into it. So if we are going to take this fund and start using it for something else, whatever it is, then that's a problem. Um, and when it comes to tree planting, some of that's dollars. I know we had provided $50,000 more to Tree Charlotte. Um, that came from, I think, general account. That didn't come from TCPP. So I, I just need to understand before I can say yes to this. Ms. Ajmira, we're going to um, send this to the um, TAP community, committee, sorry, community committees, commissions, whatever. So it's going to go to committee for review, and we're going to get a copy out to everyone. So I think that we've got some time to... Um, um, look into it a little bit more. So I, th you don't have to say yes right now, but I think if we can get that out and then get it into committee pretty quickly. Um, Mr. Phipps also had a question, though, about the same topic. Um, but Ms. Ashmere, do you want to comment any more or more yeah, questions? Yes, so I just want to make sure if it's part of the 2040 plan, I'm not comfortable with it because I, I just don't know what impact it's going to have. Uh, and I, it looks like flexibility means less acreage we are buying. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I put it out there because if I see that, I, I don't know if I can support the plan. Okay. Mr. Jones wanted to reply. He may know more about this than... Um, Thanks. So, Councilmember Ashmira, I, I do believe that with Tree Charlotte, maybe two years ago, we found some flexibility in the fund. Um, because for years, uh, Tree Charlotte wanted to use some of those dollars for tree planting. Ty, I think I have this right. And I want to say it may have been a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. But the concept was the tree planting had to be on, I don't know if it was public property, but it was a property that, that was um, clearly um, a, ear earmarked. So we'll get you more information. I guess, Mayor Mike question or my comment is this is the first well let me back up so, so my assumption is this is going in to 
a document that the this, council yes, will receive it's, the, it's, yeah, next it's, week? Yes, it is in the uh, tree canopy action plan that we're going to send to the council. Okay. It's a recommendation okay. from the tree canopy action plan. It does not necessarily have to reside in the comprehensive plan, but I wanted to respond to the developer's question about what that means, and that's why I'm bringing it forward today. Okay, Ms. Ashmira? What I understand that this is going in the other document, not necessarily in the 2040 plan. Is that correct? It doesn't have to, yes. But we will okay. still have to make sure that there's a connection, though, between just like the plan has relationship with a CAP or a um, 2030 transit system plan, we're referring to certain documents also uh, that could be companion documents to this one. So we just wanted to make sure that we make that distinction when you see a tree conservation fund in the plan, the reference to that is not necessarily creating a new fund, but we don't have to, um, but it resides primarily in the tree canopy action plan. Okay, and and that's fine. Oh, I guess what I struggle with right now, we are already losing our tree canopy at a very fast pace. And uh, if we provide more flexibility out of this fund, we are going to be, we are going to even lose more acreage. Currently, we are losing, I think, three football fields of tree canopy every week. Uh, and um, if you're going to take these funds now all of a sudden and provide flexibility, we got to figure out a way to first of all increase our acreage, not decrease it. Uh, and that's what flexibility would do. Um, so I, I have real concerns around this. Okay. I, I just, um, even if it's part of the tree canopy action plan and eventually it will all roll into this. Uh, entire process, but uh, we we got to we got to fix this one. We are trying to increase our tree canopy, not decrease it. I think we ought to have the urban forest people talk t to make an appointment to talk with you um, about this in more detail, and and so that we have the complete information. So, can we make that arrangement? Yes, Miss Jackson, to go ahead and have that conversation so that there's an understanding. And then Ms. Ajmira's questions, if she has more, we can be actually more informed about what we're talking about. And I think that would be important to do. Okay. Ms. Ajmira, is that, is that suitable to have set something up like that? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so next we have, um, we have Ms. Johnson, Mr. Bakari, and Mr. Winston. Ms. Johnson? Thank you. What happened to me? Thank you. Oh, were you next? Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did I miss your I question on the trees? Yes. Ms. Johnson, do you mind if I'm this sorry. is on the trees? Okay, I, had a, I have a quick question. All right, Mr. Phipps. Yes. Uh, was this um, tree canopy preservation program, was that formally approved by the council? The TCPP, I believe so, yes. That was definitely prior to my time, I believe so. I think we adopted that a while back. A while back. Program, so I, I think most of us are familiar with it. It hasn't yeah. added up to be what I think, again, it's one of those, I'm not sure how it, much it's added up to be and accomplish. Okay, so Mr. Phipps? That's round. Okay, all right, now Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I wanna thank um, Taiwo and, and staff. I know that it's a hard, Job. I know that um, it's hard to manage this this growth. I mean, it's it's almost unrealistic. So I want to challenge my colleagues to think about something. We keep hearing that over 200,000 new residents will move to Charlotte in, in the next 20 years. Well, I want you to imagine if the number was 1 million. Uh, today I was in a committee meeting and one of the staff members said that the population is estimated to reach 2 million um, by 2030. So I don't know which number is correct, but I, but I do want to know how, we, how could we manage that growth and what are we willing to compromise for that growth? Is it public safety 
in record numbers of homicides because our police force is understaffed by almost 200 officers? Is it overcrowding of schools when 70% of our at-risk students aren't college ready or reading at grade level? Is it lack of public safety due to lack of transportation options or lack of road infrastructure and sidewalks? Um, what is it that will make us say enough? Are we willing to compromise our neighborhoods or lose three football fields of, of tree canopy every week? or to put multifamily units on every square inch of our available lots, um, will we continue to ignore that low, lower income residents are forced to live in hotels and motels, or that we actually had a real live tent city on our streets? And um, once the eviction moratorium is lifted and temporary housing subsidy expires, we may see that again. I really want to understand from a planning perspective how a city can accommodate unrestrained, unrestrained growth. We know there's little opportunity to annex. What's next? Rezoning petitions for tree houses? What is our goal? Is I it actually th think that's not a bad idea. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Don't I give him ideas. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> what is our goal? Is our goal to have the badge of honor of being one of the largest cities in the nation while compromising the quality of life for current residents? I challenge our colleagues to decide which badge of honor they're pursuing. Is it to serve one of the biggest cities or one of the best? Mm. I moved to Charlotte six years ago because Charlotte is a beautiful city. It's got the character of the uh, small town with a big, and it's a, a big city, so there's this mix. It's thriving. It has, has lots of character. But we have to be intentional in, maintain, in maintaining that. Um, I say we be bold in taking steps to maintain quality over quantity, perhaps by focusing on sprawl rather than density and working with our contigu contiguous counties to develop reciprocal plans that benefit our city, their cities, and especially our residents. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, two final points from me. Um, one, back to the theme of, of the things designed to confuse us and fancy footwork. The ULI thing, I hope all of you participated in it. I did. Um, I had a lovely conversation with two people they assigned to me. I'm assuming they assigned them strategically <laughs> because we did have a good conversation. And then I watched their recap at 5 o'clock on Friday. And I was just astounded by how little information of relevance that we got. It was interesting. It was basically what we should have had from our planning staff three years ago happen. But it, there was no outcomes. There were no, uh, the, the only outcome or analysis they provided was that they're sure we need to hire them on for multiple more phases so that they can then give us that information. So I'm not saying there aren't some really smart people there. There definitely were. But I simply asked one question to try to help us here tonight. And I think it's the crux of the question we have to be asking, which is why do we need to codify these tactical policy level items in the plan now? Why can't we do the work and put them in later? I said, all these other things are great and how I feel about it and you know my emotional state, love all that, thanks. But why do we have to do that now? And I put that in the chat and the response that was given back to that was, because you guys are so brave. So if that's what we just paid for, I just want you to say, and I'm not trying to bash ULI, it's a great organization, they do a lot of great work. Their guidance back right now is irrelevant to what we're doing. And it is fancy footwork if they keep saying, well, CBAs, wait till the ULI stuff comes. We're getting no help from ULI on CBAs, just to be crystal clear. And that brings me to the final point, which is it, I hope you see the double standards that just, I've already brought your attention to one of them of height is bad with density, but single families plots are good for density. Um, uh, the other crux of, of the, the, the double standard in this plan that's all over it is, if it's something that certain one or two people that have designed it like, they need it in there, but I'll tell you, in five years we can update it. Because if that's wrong, that's fine. Like, we had that example earlier today with well, when we figure out how Instacart, which is here today, works, um, then we'll add that five years from now. But if it's something like, oh, we don't know how single family zoning abolishment will work, or we don't know how community benefit agreements will work or whatever, the point is we must keep them in now. We must. 
Well, why can't we add them in five years if this is such a living document, once they actually do the work and figure it out? And the answer to that is very simple. A very small number of people have personal aspirations themselves that they don't want to do the work. They want the credit for it in here now and, and damned be the results for the city of Charlotte that happened for it. And that's why the people who are fighting here right now against this, and they don't share the same party, sex, color, or multiple other things, have unified in this strange manner because we are not accepting that right now. When we get to those other points a year from now with the UDO, we'll probably disagree then. But we're in agreement on this now. And I hope that sends this community a real strong message that if this squeaks by with six votes and what they're doing, that is a definite loss. Madam Mayor. I have Mr. Winston and then Mr. Graham. Mr. Winston, I'm sorry, Mr. Winston, Mr. Eggleston, Mr. Graham. Mr. Winston. Mr. Winston, oh, he doesn't have any more. Okay, he's not up anymore? Okay, Mr. Eggleston. Mine will be real brief. One, to point out that aside from the party affiliation, the group that is likely to vote yes on this shares the same diversity that the group is likely to vote against it, um, but for having a Republican in its, in its midst. Um, but I also just want to push back on the idea. It sounded like a point that was being made earlier implied that we're deciding whether Charlotte is going to continue to grow exponentially or not. It is growing exponentially. It's going to continue to grow exponentially, and we are now deciding whether or not we're going to adjust the way that we accommodate that growth and accommodate those people. They're coming one way or the other, so we, we can't stop that. We're not building a wall around Charlotte, so we've got to adjust the way we think about it if we're going to accommodate those people and give them the opportunity to live a, a fruitful life in our community. Mr. Graham? Yeah, I, I, I just want to make sure that folks who are watching, that that's a minority opinion, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's a minority. All right, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. And, and whether it's six votes or 11 votes, I think everyone around this dais has the strategic best interest of the city of Charlotte in mind. Uh, and if you don't abuse, or agree with that opinion, you've expressed it tonight. You've expressed it two weeks ago. You expressed it two months ago. We get it. But it's still in a minority opinion. The city is growing. We, are, we have a plan in place that I support. Uh, and, and I support it not because I have a relationship with the planning director or I have a relationship with the, with the mayor or the manager. I support it because I believe it's in the best interest of the city and that, that we have an opportunity to um, build a framework that works for the city, a vision that works for the city, uh, and I trust the process, right? And I trust the people who are leading the process and I don't have any doubts about that. But is, is this a perfect document? Hell no, it's not. But we've made some, and we made some mistakes before, Madam Mayor. We built a, 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 college, a Coliseum on Tyvola Road and then came back and built another one uptown. That was the plan. Good job on that, by the way. Exactly. Well, I voted to move it. <laughs> right? So there will be mistakes along the way, expensive mistakes. But it doesn't mean that we don't strive to be great or we try to you know, think about what sh tools and policies that we don't have today that may be illegal today, but we may need tomorrow. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think the citizens of Charlotte have a problem with that. you got a problem with that. I respect that. But again, that's a minority opinion. And I, I, again, I, I think if we pass this thing with six votes, no one's gonna give a damn that the day after it passes they want to know what are we going to do to build a better community. That's what matters. Yes. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, I understand where both sides are coming from. I do think that we've got to fundamentally decide what is our competitive advantage. I've said it many times before. We keep saying, well, the people are coming regardless. I don't necessarily know that to be true in the sense of people are going to make decisions about where they would prefer to live based on what each city offers. 
And at some point, for the same reasons people are leaving all of the 14 cities that are larger than us, we got to make sure that they're not leaving Charlotte for the same reasons. So I do think that we need to be critical about what we're putting on the putting in this plan because it's critical to who we will be 20 years from now. And I don't think that it's a given. I believe that there are certainly people around here, around this dais, that all of us want what's best for the city. And frankly, I'm, I find it a little disrespectful to dismiss people's opinions because they're in the minority. Because when we talk about what people in this community want to hear and what they want to see, they've already expressed that they don't feel heard. So how many of us does it have to be before somebody takes what we're saying seriously? The minority is not just to be dragged along with whatever the majority says. The point in having diversity of opinion is to get better plans, not to win, but to have the best plan that we can possibly have. And I will point out, as several have before, I don't think it is a coincidence that five of seven district reps who are accountable to these communities directly are all saying the same thing. Our districts are completely different in some aspects. And my district in particular, the largest in landmass, is the most diverse di district in this city. And I can tell you from Still Creek to Pawtucket to South End to West Boulevard, they all have different needs. What we can agree on is a lot of the fundamental values. And that was what the intention of this plan was to be. We've all said it before. If we would stick to the values and our principles, we could have passed this plan months ago because we don't differ there. We're not having a difference of values. We're having a difference of implementation. And that's the piece that we've got to correct. What we're saying is that if we're going to talk the details, let's make sure we got some data to back it up. I want to trust the process, but I need to know what that process is going to be. Because when I look back and I ask for for information that justifies the decisions that have been made, I'm not finding something that is compelling and that's concerning to me. Because to your point, mistakes are going to be made. We know that. But that doesn't absolve us of our responsibility to forecast and to try to minimize that risk. And so I would just ask everybody around, whether you're in the minority or the majority, to please consider what else you personally can do to try to make this the best plan for all of our residents, not the ones that will be here 20 years from now, the people that we represent today. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Driggs. Uh, just briefly, I, I agree with you that as a matter of naked power politics, you guys can win, okay? And, well, sir, I'm speaking. Uh, yes, but wouldn't it be better, is all I've said, and I say it again, wouldn't it be better if we were able to achieve a larger majority and project a little more consensus to our constituents and, and not sort of uh, take on board a great difference of opinion in the community? And my feeling about this is that we don't need to do that. We can pass this plan in such a way that just about everybody agrees, wow, this was a good day for Charlotte. And, and so that, that's the only point in my mind. I, I just think it would be preferable. So yeah, the majority can do it, but there's a lot of writing, if you look at it, about what the significance is of the minority in a majority rule environment. And it is not intended that the majority is simply walked all over by the people who have bigger numbers. So let's try to come together on this thing, is all I'm saying. And if we can't, then you're right then the majority, the current majority wins. Madam the Mayor, just one point. The, the, the point I was trying to make is at some point we got to vote. And I don't think that it's fair for someone to disparage the, minor, the, the majority opinion of this council. That's the point. So I, I get what you're saying, right? But at some point we got to vote. And I don't want the vote, no matter what it is, to be frowned upon because, oh my God, it only passed by six votes, so something might be wrong with it. No, it passed by six votes because the majority of members of the council believed in it. And we can agree that we disagree, but we all agree that we want to move the city forward. So it's not stumping on the minority, it's just stating the obvious. At some point, we've got to raise our hands and vote. And when, the, when that vote occurs, it has to be, the community has to have some confidence in it. And if you're disparaging the vote before it even occurs, then, again, I think that's a disservice as well. 
Thank you. I'm not disparaging the majority. I'm just asking you, don't you think it would be better if we were able to achieve an eight or nine vote majority instead of being so deeply divided? That's all I'm asking. This council has been deeply divided since we took office a year and a half ago on a number of issues. Motion to close? Wait. I just have a quick point. Spoken. I mean, really pretty much everybody that wanted to raise their hand. Um, it's always tough to sit and listen to disparaging remarks about individuals. It's something that this council has been doing more frequently than I would like to say or acknowledge. Um, there was a time that this council, you know, laughed. Um, many Ma councils we can hear before. You. I'm, I'm saying that it's it's very difficult to listen to the disparaging remarks. They extend beyond this issue, but this issue has made them very real and very ugly. And I believe that um, we can be better than this, than what we've been doing, no matter how heated the debate or no matter how difficult the subject. What I have um, heard in this room in the last two months has been really pretty remarkably, um, I think, lacking in respect of each other. And for whatever part we each individually play in that, um, I think that we all really need to think about it. I've been particularly um, sensitive to um, the people that work with us every day to try to do their very best. I mean, people, you say, well, people have the right to choose where to live. They also have the right to choose where to work. And Charlotte's reputation has always been one of being a great employer and a place that people sought out. When we get applications for things, for people in significant positions, they, I mean, we have always gotten really quality applications. But if the board of directors starts talking about people that work for them or the citizens that are being disparaged or each other, I think we've all got to think about it differently because there, there is nothing like reputational risk that you can lose. Once you lose your reputational risk, you lose your reputation. What do they say? It's like somebody that complains, complains seven times and you get one compliment. And the ratio of the ability for us to complain and disparage each other has been running, I think, towards the sevens. So I, I, I think that it's time to really adjourn. I think, Larkin, thank you for making the motion. Second. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I would encourage us all to reflect on our part that we play in this work that makes a difference. You can, you can be disagreeable without attacking people, and I think that's what we all ought to be striving for again. So we have a motion to adjourn, and I believe that's unanimous. Thank you very much.